questions, please put them in the comments below and we'll get to them in the end. Um, so in alphabetical order, first we've got Abdi. So if I can also ask that all panelists just mute themselves if they're not speaking. Thank you. Abdi, go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Abdi Ismail. I'm calling from uh, Hertfordshire, UK. Uh, the first question about the PPE. I think um, my point of view is this was something uh, that was already set up. So all the, all the media hype about PPE being short, it's, it was just a uh, distraction with Are you high anyway. So uh, it was, everything was in place and it was just to get, whip, up, whip up this uh, COVID myth that was, that was still impacting the whole world. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, the theories, the theories is, uh, where can I start? Uh, it's just outrageous uh, to, to uh, they're telling us uh, to shut a world economy for, for someone that ate a bat in somewhere in the wet market in Asia. So I don't know about you guys, but that's not gonna, that's not gonna run with me. It, it, it's, it's a, uh, this was, this was a pre-planned uh, to, to get a, a lot of control in, in, in especially the Western countries and, uh, and, and all the African countries are, are being, 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 being bought in terms of uh, jumping, jumping on, on, on this uh, WHO uh, bandwagon. So uh, I don't believe none of it. This is, this is uh, what, what, everything that's done in the dark will come out eventually. And, uh, and yeah, it's just, just an outrageous way of to, to, to get people's, uh, yeah, get hold of people's human rights. So what you're saying, I mean, are you basically saying that you don't believe COVID-19 exists? Is that what you're listen, saying? Listen, yeah, a lot, of pe a lot of people died. Yeah, but uh, this is, this is my stand. Everybody, everybody in this world has to die one day. No one's gonna die twice. So everybody that, that, that died was, was their time. Uh, so, uh, and I'm sure you, lot, you, you lot are aware that everybody, the most majority of people that died, they were, they were a certain age and they all had underlying, uh, underlying health, health conditions. So, and they tell us, and I can't remember last time I've heard anyone that died that normal causes. How come all of a sudden everything is COVID? Everything's COVID. What, what happened to all the, all the uh, heart problems? What happened to all the uh, cancer patients? Blood, uh, blood pressures? I don't hear that normal. All I hear is COVID, COVID, COVID. There, I mean, it's, it's, we're all grown ups here. So uh, this is a bigger, this is a bigger uh, a world control. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be uh, taken. Yeah, it's just, it's just outrageous. But. I mean, uh, if I go, I'll come back for my, for my, for my rest of, rest of my time. Uh, okay. Uh, All right. Later, inshallah. All right. Thank you, Abdi. Um, Amina, if we can get your opening statement, please. Hi, guys. My name is Amina, and I'm a healthcare worker who's based in London. <clears throat> One second, Amina. Can you, Abdi, can you just make sure you, um, you mute yourself while, while someone else is speaking as well? Thank you. Yes. Go on, Amina. So oh, yeah, so I'm a healthcare worker who works in London. I've got 12 years of experience and I, uh, I don't normally work in ICU, but for COVID, I was relocated to ICU. So I've had, I've got like a 12, 13 year career. In that career, I have been around when we had SARS. I was around when we had swine flu and I was in Saudi Arabia when we had MERS, COVID-1. And um, you have not been here, I've been here now when we had this COVID-2. So um Listen, I'm here just one thing that basically that this coronavirus has um, highlighted for me is that in this world, we've got two types of people. One thing I've learned is got two types of people. So what Abdi has said is uh, we know that people who died were of a certain age. Uh, this is all a master plan. And this was basically to gain control over God knows what's it. He can say this, okay, he can say this from the comfort of his home. He is a man, he's a, he's a man, he's young, he's fit, he's healthy, he has no underlying health condition. So he is in the group of people who are currently winning when it comes to COVID, okay? It doesn't affect you. Who it affected are people who are less fortunate than you. The whole thing with coronavirus, how the coronavirus started, look, it's definitely a strange disease that we haven't seen before, but the coronavirus is nothing new. Is this our first pandemic in the history of humanity? No. In the last hundred years, we've had about 10 pandemics alone, okay? It's 
Was the pandemic something that happened during the Prophet Sallallahu time? Yes, it was. Did he deal with it in the same exact way that we've dealt with it? Yes, he did. Okay, so the thing is, Abdi, what you're saying, oh, certain people died. Alhamdulillah, I wasn't your nan. Okay, Alhamdulillah, thank God that you were sitting at home. You know, all you had to do is buy, you had to save a life by just sitting at home. We had to go to work and hold people's die, dying people's hands. We had to do things that we wouldn't do in any other way. Yes, you're right. Everything suddenly became COVID. However, it could be somebody who had cancer, that immunocompromised, meaning their immune is already kind of like a bit weak. And all it did was for COVID to just knock him over. Now they're dead. Okay. PPE. If the NHS, if the NHS, if my colleagues in Northwick Park had to wear bin, bin liners to defend themselves, what do you think that the PPE um, situation in developing countries like Af in Somaliland or Somalia is like? Non-existent. Because unfortunately, with the way that the Western world is currently running, all the manufacturing factories are either in, in Asia mainly. Okay, China, the center and the epicenter of the Wuhan crisis um, of the coronavirus was in Wuhan to begin with. Okay, so what we did to just to buy ourselves time, we had the whole world had to stop. Okay, while we did some restructuring, if I as a healthcare person who does not normally work in ICU had to be trained to work in ICU to help my colleagues, what does that tell you? The whole world had to stop restructure so we can fight this invisible enemy. Okay, what, it, what coronavirus has done to society is very well documented. What it did to healthcare professionals is something that no one's talking about yet. Okay, you are lucky that, mashallah, you're fit, young and healthy. It didn't affect you. So of course you're going to be more susceptible to believing those theories. But I think that theory is so disrespectful to people like me. And furthermore, if you are a man of the ilm, you know what our religion says about this. Okay, and you know damn well that was so called that pandemic happened during the Prophet ﷺ time. And he dealt with it by A, the first thing he did was, quarantine he stopped all travel did we stop did we stop all travel between the world yes we did okay isolation did we he said don't put a sick patient he said don't put a sick patient next to a healthy patient did we do that yes we did he said don't go visit stop stay where you are cleanliness so i don't understand how someone like you who's meant to be and again when we are talking about coronavirus, we know that the BME, BME community has been hit and the Somali community specifically has been, A, it has been hit. You have not lost three Somali patients in one night, Abdi. You cannot talk, okay? This is selfish. You and every single conspirator are selfish and you've actually contributed towards, to the death of these patients by giving them false information while we tried very hard to fight and say, this thing is a reality. From the beginning, when the Som for example, the Somali community, when they did not believe that this virus is real, they were dying in the hundreds, not in the hundreds, but let's say at least five tens, they were dying across London, okay? Because we had a little hotline going on. Marka, when people started dying one by one, and then this virus became very real for our community, and our community members stayed at home, let me tell you what happened in the intensive care units and on the wards. I'm not seeing as many Somali patients. We went from seeing like say five Somali patients to seven Somali patients in a week to virtually none. Access to information and the appropriate information, Abdi, works. Okay. And because of the, our communities already does, doesn't trust the police, it doesn't trust the education system, and it sure doesn't trust the healthcare system. So when you come around with attitudes like, oh, you know what? Certain people had to die. Uh, because it wasn't your nan. No, 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 Abdi, don't give me that. Don't shake your head. Conspirators, people who spread fake news are like one of the leading causes of death, okay? You, you, and, and I'll tell you how about this. Let's make it a race thing. Name me one single conspirator from Africa. Majuro, okay? All the conspirators are conspiring from their Western countries on their, from their warm homes, where they've got access to clean water, where, God forbid, if they had to become sick, they've got access to hospital. Name me a conspirator from Africa, and I'll come back to you. And that's my opening statement before I eat your head off. Um, thank you, Amina, for that. Yeah, opening statement. Um, There's next, more coming. <laughs> James, you're next. Amina, if you can just mute yourself, thank you. Wow, 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 wow. 
that was uh, that was quite intense there. God, I felt I felt the passion. Um, hello, guys. It's a, before I start, it's an absolute pleasure to be on this platform. Um, Abby invited me, and uh, I just want to share information with you. Um, my job is not to get into conflict with anyone. If it sets off, a, if it plants a few seeds or gets people thinking the positive way, um, that's my job. Um, my job is not to create any hysteria or blame one for people dying in the comfort of their own homes. My job is to just bring information that maybe you haven't heard before. So anyway, my name's uh, James Tweed and I have been on a journey for 10 years and my journey's basically been to try and find a way of in which is a more natural way of living. And growing up, I was very very, very health conscious, always followed allopathic medicine. Then I turned to alternative medicine and I realized after a while that alternative medicine and allopathic medicine was pretty much the same. It extended from the same branches. Uh, not until a friend of mine whose wife was, uh, had free blood clots in her leg and then she was either gonna have her legs amputate or she would be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Um, did my friend actually make drastic action because the doctor said otherwise she has her legs amputated or she'd be in a wheelchair and she'll be on permanent medication for the rest of life. So he made drastic action to try and find someone who could potentially help her. Um, he found uh, someone called John Fielder. Uh, John Fielder is a natural hygienist. He is a qualified osteopath and chiropractor. He's also a lifestyle coach. And natural hygiene is basically an alternative to all medicine, which basically works with the, the laws of nature to heal and restore the body back to its natural self, because we believe that the body is a self-healing organism, and which it is. So my friend actually carried his wife, got hold of John Fielder, carried his wife out of the bottle, and he fasted his wife under the supervision of John Fielder over Skype for 10 days. Um, his wife is walking to this day, the blood clots have all gone. Um, and that set a massive light bulb within me. Um, I gave up loads of processed food. I gave up dri uh, fizzy drinks. I gave up meat. I gave up sweets, chocolate, you name it. I gave up my whole lifestyle was completely changed overnight to try and find what I was looking for. And I realized that all illness caused is by ourselves, by our own indiscretions because we, have, we must and have to take full responsibility for our actions. And I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so I started reading, I got in touch with John Fielder and I, I, I lost sight in one eye one day. So I woke up one day and because I was going through these healing processes, these healing crises, what we call in natural hygiene, um, I lost eye, sight in one eye one day. And I then started to fast and I went six days fast and then I spent 25 days on a raw food diet. My eyes stored back to its full health um, with a condition which if in modern medicine, they'd say that you would have to go back to the hospital every, um, every six months for the rest of your life. So again, again, the power of the body and the power of the healing mechanism, mechanism of the body then was, was for me to see. So I then I made the conscious decision to move to Australia, where I was taught by John Fielder himself. Um, you guys can look him up on YouTube. He has many books. He's written hundreds of books on the topic, natural hygiene. Um, and I was, I'm, he, he was my mentor for three years. And I have seen a guy um, help, not heal, but a guy assist and help people with various illnesses, uh, incurable illnesses like type 1 diabetes, type 2, we've had cancer, brain tumors, we've had multiple cirrhosis, arthritis, all these types of people who have gone to him, who have gone to modern medicine, who haven't helped, who are getting worse, and eventually have gone to John as a last resort, and through the power of the body, through fasting, through raw food, through fresh air, through exercise, through sleep, and the most important thing is uh, clean water, um, they have managed to restore their health back to full health. Now, just going on, so I'm at the process now where I sort of understand health quite very well. Um, the first topic I would like to say on the PPE price is that if any of you actually in this room think the government weren't prepared for this, then you must be, you must be um, on a different planet. Because when the government wants to go to war, 
and they want to blow up the Middle East, they have everything prepared the very next day. Why do you think they don't have the right PPE? It's not because they're not prepared, it's because they want this to go a certain way. They want to create hysteria, they want to create anger, and they also want to create a sort of a, a hive mentality where people are actually back in the NHS where they're gonna get millions and millions of pounds of funding. So the government doesn't have to do it for them. They're actually the, the taxpayer who actually we pay for it are actually funding the NHS again to get the equipment that they need. Um, in terms of PPE in third world countries, can I just say to everyone in this room, I wish everyone this I wish people with the mindset PP is a concern in the third world countries have the same mindset when it comes to clean water and sanitation because that's the number one biggest killer in all third world countries is clean water and sanitation um, and that's what's killing millions and millions of people because we don't have we don't have the resources or the, the governments in those countries are not willing to provide that through uh, foreign aid and so on and so forth. Uh, secondly, uh, we're talking about a COVID-19 conspiracy. Um, I would actually turn that around and if you look at history um, and Amina, I'm sorry if I got your name wrong, um, um, we're talking about history here. Um, if you look at history, the last biggest pandemic was uh, uh, near enough 100 years ago, which was the Spanish flu, which killed up to 50 million people. Now, the Spanish flu was only called the Spanish flu due to the Spanish actually bringing out data saying that people were dying of this flu. All the rest of the countries were fighting a world war. Spain was a neutral country. And so Spain, that's why they called it the Spanish flu. But the more majority of people that were getting this so-called virus were actually in military camps where their sanitation and the water was dirty. So people were dying again from unhygienic uh, living standards. One, one more minute left. Okay. Energy limb stands. Okay, so the last last minute I like to say. Sorry, I rambled on to talk too much. Um, I would like to say this to anyone, to Samira, who's a doctor, or Amina. There is no proof that a virus exists because in order for a virus to exist, there has to have be three components of that. It has to be photographed through an electron microscope. It has to be isolated from the host cell, and it has to be biochemically categorized. And if I have, through all medical journals, I have not seen one shred of any evidence on that. To attack Abdi or to attack me, the fear is on you because you have to prove beyond doubt that this is real. And through modern medicine's own literature, they can't even prove it. And if you go onto Google and put coronavirus and you ask to see a picture of the live virus, all you can see is cartoon pictures. The BBC Sky News will show you cartoon pictures and if we want to talk science, rather than getting angry, there is no proof it exists in their own medical literature. And that is 100% proof that this coronavirus is not what people say it is. All right. Thank you, James. Um, next, we're going to go to Salma. Hello. Um, Hello, James, everyone. You yourself, please, while um, Salma is talking. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> this was a very interesting discussion with different points, but I'm going to begin with uh, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Salma Ahmed. I am a fourth year medical student. I just finished my fourth year, so I'm beginning my fifth year. And I am uh, calling in from Sweden. Uh, so right now, during my summer holiday, I am working at a children's cardiology ward, and that's why I'm in my whole <laughs> scrubs, because I'm running off to a night shift after this. So I do not live in these clothes. Um, okay, so let's start with the subject then. Uh, when it comes to the subject of PPE, in the early days of the pandemic, um, early February, when the virus was just something with news coming out of China, us students were banned from OR, ORs theaters and every ward that required any type of extra equipment. Not because of limiting virus, but to protect the health workers in if the pandemic were to reach us. So it was because of the lack of PPE. So our education was halted to protect the medical professionals, right? Um, and, whoa, shit, all right. Uh, okay, and uh, to address, I think what COVID-19 really has done is highlighted the, short, um, the fragility of our globalized 
you know, systems as we know it. We see seemingly well-functioning healthcare systems in the West breaking down. So in light of a new pathogen, right? So if we're to look at PP shortages, and I've heard a lot of comments right now saying it's fake or um, the bringing up, usually when you hear this, you bring up Spanish flu. But what you don't hear is SARS emerged. Thankfully, we can talk about these as localized endemics. Endemics is outbreaks in local areas. And that is thanks to healthcare professionals sounding an alarm early, isolation of these areas. And that's why we didn't see them spread so far out in the population as COVID has done, right? Um, and so because of this, uh, a lot of people uh, at that time looked at the WHO saying, oh, you overreacted because of the pandemic not spreading. And a lot of politicians or governments actually started to not fill up. They weren't prioritizing the PPE supplement. So to say that there isn't a shortage, it's if you looked at the supplies in the countries, they were depleted since 2003 onward without being refilled. So the shortage is not a myth. That is an absolute lie. There was a shortage. And when you look at um, the sudden overnight increase in demands, of course, you're going to have an imbalance of supply and need, right? Um, and then when we look at the impact on developing countries, there, there is a global shortage. So developing countries are not on any priority list. So of course, when it comes to buying PPE supplies, what's needed is money. So raising funds. And we all know that the Somali diaspora is famously known. For, uh, we, uh, I know Somali diaspora has built roads, have built hospitals, have built sent medical equipment. So in part of financial power and mobilization, we're very good at helping our own, right? Um, and I think when we look at developing countries, it's easy to say what they lack. And I don't think a lot of people look at what they have. And um, if we look in African countries, for example, Senegal right now has um, our testing equipment made under $1 for COVID testing. Um, I saw a news clip of a Somali engineer, a young guy, 22 year old, who had built a ventilator of, uh, what was it? It was woods. And, I don't, I'm not an engineer, but it was wood and machinery and simple scraps he had found. Those are inspiring things because what Africa has and Somalia has is a brilliant young population with ideas. And I think what we should do in for developing countries we should because necessity is the invention of all mothers right so we should invest in those ideas because realistically we're not going to build plants we're not gonna in one year or six months but what we can do is find these solutions within these local areas that works in local places and fundraise and help these young innovative minds right and i think that's the solution to the problem in in Africa and in Somalia. Um, I think the second topic was, um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't raise money for ventilators and buy things, absolutely not, but we should do this alongside for a more long-term sustainable uh, solution. Oh, when it comes to the topic of the building lives, I think everyone should look at themselves and hold themselves accountable for what they share because they are killing people. We saw in all of the world. We saw in Sweden, we've seen a huge population of Somali. A statistic shows that was published two days ago that the median age of the people dying from COVID-19 in other populations, we've looked at Eritreans, you know, Arabs, um, whatnot, was around 75 plus, up to 80 years old. The median age of death in Somali populations was six, I think 66 or 68, but significantly lower. So by spreading these false lies, you are downplaying the whole thing and uh, encouraging a lack of compliance among populations. By uh, spreading these fake cures, you are, I, I'm, I get so angry when I hear things like that because um, people are seeking medical help late and there are not, um, by not watching you killing your aunts. You might not be killing yourself because I'm a healthy young individual, alhamdulillah. So my, for myself, I'm not worried. But for the people now going into a ward with people in a risk group, I cannot be incompliant or inconsiderate. 
it's, it won't affect me. It will affect everyone around me. And I, I don't see who they are. They could be people I meet in the streets. They can be my family. It could be anything like that. So I think it's important to check yourselves and check everything you do before you publish anything or spread it further. Thank you. Thank you, Salma. Um, next, we have Ikram. Asalaamu As Alaikum, everyone. I hope you guys are all doing good. I'm really honored today for you guys to invite me. Um, so my name is Ikram Prisa. I am in Somalia currently. I live in Somalia. I've been in Somalia for the past seven years. I'm also a medical student. Um, I am in my final year, alhamdulillah. I'm in my sixth year of medicine and I'll be graduating towards the end of the year. Um, a lot of things have been said that I can literally scratch my head upon, but you know, we're gonna stay on topic. When it comes to the global PPE shortages, I really can't talk about developing countries because I'm in an underdeveloped country. When it comes to Somalia, we rely on developed countries. And that's the truth. We rely on America, we rely on Turkey, we rely on China or any of these out of countries. And when you, we see them already in a struggle, them having shortages, them not even having enough, you know, equipment for their own hospitals, for their own patients, what can we say? What can we do about that? What can we do about that? You guys are literally in developed countries, UK, America, everywhere around the world, but we're in Somalia. It went to the point where the, the things that we can find in the country, just a simple face mask or hand sanitizer, the prices tripled. For me to buy hand sanitizer, it used to be $2 before I, when I was doing rounds. Now, $15. Not everyone can afford that. Not everyone can afford that at all. Um, and it's really sad to see people think, you know, oh, this is a conspiracy theory. Like, this is not true. Um, people are dying, yes. I do agree, people will die every day, but are you denying that everything that's happened has not happened and that it's all fake and that people are just playing games and just, you know, coronavirus, coronavirus, that the government wants us to think of something else and keep us occupied and maybe hiding something bigger? Conspiracy theories aren't going anywhere. They're just going to literally put you in a little circle and you're just going to go crazy about it, to be honest. Um, I'm going to go to the second top point. When it comes to the COVID theories, Somalia is number one when it comes to just being out there from the virus dies in the heat to why are you wearing a mask do you have COVID-19 take it off you don't you don't need to wear that mask it's just it, it continues to having a curfew only late at night but not during the daytime because our economy can't stand on it people work people's daily earnings are on it people will make five dollars a day and they need that five dollars to feed their families whereas Americans are getting checks in the mail where Canadians are also getting checks in the mail, where UK, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. But I am, inshallah, that, that I'm done. That's my statement. And inshallah, I'll put more towards the, yeah. Thank you, Kram. Next, we have Samira. Hi, salam alaikum, everybody. Um, my name is Samira, also known as Dr. Samira Hassan, and I am a GP or a family physician, as some parts of the world call it, based in the UK in a city called Leicester. And specifically with regards to, to the pandemic, just like Amina, just like our lovely medical students, um, a lot of us have been um, working quite heavily. All of our working time has been heavily covered or you know, talked about is nothing but coronavirus. And it has changed a lot of things, not just in the way it's affecting patients, but also in our daily working practices. But where do I begin? I thought this uh, debate was talking about two specific questions, which is the global impact of um, the lack of PPE to how it's affecting developing countries and the, and, uh, the ability to manage COVID-19 and also the conspiracy, the conspiracy theories. But I think to for the sake of orderliness in this debate, I'm not going to um, touch upon the points that each of James and Abdi have mentioned that I have a lot more questions on until later on. So I'll just start off with my opening statement initially. So with regards to the global um, shortage of PPE, that has been a massive problem from the beginning. Regardless of whether you believe that coronavirus is something that's been cooked up in a lab somewhere in China with conspiracy with USA, 
for some new world order or something or the other. Regardless of that, it has come upon us, it has hit us. Whatever reason you believe it's come upon us, whether it's through divine fate or whether it's through some conspiracy from a government or some other entity, it has come to our doorsteps. And yes, we cannot see the virus as we cannot see many viruses and bacteria and other organisms, but it's real in the number of people who are going into hospitals, who are critically ill, who are requiring ventilation, who are requiring um, not only respiratory support, but renal support and um, circulatory support, um, and people who are, whose other multiple organs are dying or, or shutting down as a result of it. And of course, sadly, the sheer number of deaths. As we stand at the moment, nearly half, um, nearly 500,000 people have died of this um, pandemic and they say due to coronavirus. So regardless of where, where you stand on, in terms of the debates regarding conspiracy theory, this thing is real. This thing is something we're living through at the moment and we have to learn a way to deal with it. We can look back once we have the um, comfort of time to analyze how it began, why it spread like it did, who's behind it and what the aims were. So that's the first thing. But with regards to the shortage and how it's affecting developing countries, I'm not living in a developing country, but just judging from the experiences of the so-called Western superpowers, i.e. Britain, Spain, Italy, and now the US, US of A, the way it's crippling the systems, the way it's brought a lot of the healthcare systems to their knees, it's, it's shocking to see. With, re with regards to the sheer number of PPE that's required, I don't know how anybody could suspect that, that the, the numbers, the sheer numbers that are actually required. We all know pandemics happen from time to time, and Amina so eloquently described how we've had pandemics over time and lessons, or at least we've tried to learn lessons from it to prepare for the next pandemic. But how are you meant to know the very nature of future pandemics? Because this is a highly um, virulent, highly transmissible respiratory pathogen, i.e. spread through air and droplets, the, the sheer fact that you require a particular type of masks, so not just masks, the fact that you require particular type of respirators, FFP3 or N95s as they call it in the US of A, to protect you. And even then it will only protect you if you have the right type of mask fitted for you because there's no room for it to escape through or come through into your respiratory system. I, I don't know how anybody could have anticipated the sheer numbers that were required in the way that the coronavirus has swept up. Maybe that is something we need to look back and definitely dis discuss as to why the government wasn't as prepared as it should have been. And I agree with James on one point they really do have protocols and systems in place to try and mitigate for pandemics like this. So the fact that the sheer failure of this has caused at least 40,000 deaths in the UK is something that the British public is calling the government upon. And there's a lot of reviews going on to really try and comb through what are the reasons why there was a failure in making sure the PPE was um, readily, readily available in time for the healthcare staff. Because as Amina mentioned, a huge proportion of, um, and there's a high rate of deaths within healthcare staff. And none of us go into medicine or work in hospitals to save lives for us to put our lives at risk as well. And it's not something that we wish to do, but a lot of people have been dying, particularly people of BAME backgrounds. So this is something that I agree, we need to look back with time and find out at every level why this failure has happened, why the shortage have happened, why the systems that were supposed to protect us or the protocols that were supposed to be well rehearsed and well looked into for future pandemics has not worked as well. But nevertheless, the fact that there is, there has been initially a worsening crisis in terms of the global uh, production and manufacturing of PPE, the way it's affected, um, you know, our countries like Britain and, and the US of A and Spain and Italy, I think has had a massive effect on the transmission of the disease. You know, as you can imagine, the very essence of medical practice requires you to have close contact with your patients. The very essence of it requires you to have um, these kind of contacts for sustained periods of time. And like we said, this is a very virulent, highly transmissible pathogen. And therefore, a lot of doctors will be contracting this virus. I had contracted the virus and I was a GP in community practice. And without the right PPE, which we didn't have for very many weeks in the beginning, I could have easily trans Transmit, transmitted it to other patients of mine that I had been in contact with at the time. Now we've radically changed a lot of things, particularly community practice where we don't see patients face to face a lot of the time. But for those like Amina I mean, who are working on the front line in health in, within hospitals, that hasn't changed. So we could have been vectors ourselves into sharing and transmitting these viruses through to our patients. Um, and that's why a lot of people see hospitals now as current hotbeds for 
catching the virus. Coming back to the point of um, conspiracy theories. Now, there are two types of conspiracy theorists I've come across right now. There's the types like Abdi and James who talk about um, a new world order and the real essence of why this virus was manufactured for some sort of higher powers to control certain populations and bring about certain economic change uh, is one that we're looking at quite interestingly at the moment. And then there's the other lot, which are our Somali mothers or Somali elders or whatever is circulating in WhatsApp groups. And I know it happens a lot in Somalia, but it happens at massive rates, even in the UK and I'm sure other Western countries. I've had to deal with several conspiracy theories from mothers' WhatsApp groups who claim that this virus does not affect Muslims, who claim that this virus is affected um, by heat and therefore doesn't have it happen to, um, you know, in hot countries, who claim that because you're black and you're thick skinned and you've lived in a desert or you've gr grown up in a nomadic culture, your genetics necessarily mean uh, don't necessarily mean that you'll die of it. And we've realized that that's actually completely the opposite. Blacks are more likely to die of this virus. We've even had conspiracy theories and actual recordings of uh, voice notes that's been circulated like wildfire within WhatsApp groups where they've talked about of urging people to avoid hospitals altogether because you will be given lethal injections if you come into hospital with coronavirus because they're trying to reduce the number of Muslims or they're trying to reduce the number of black and ethnic minorities in the UK and that's their way of population control. There's a lot I've seen and, and sadly not only has it you know, um, continued to make a lot of people, initially at least, believe that this isn't the actual problem that it is right now. People continued visiting each other. And as a community, um, not just with Somalis, but I'm sure many other ethnic groups and, 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 and people in general, we are social creatures. We visit each other a lot, you know. And when there's been deaths, you know, death, uh, deaths after death being announced within the Somali community because of COVID-19, people would congregate in their masses to come and visit the deceased's family, which is a tradition of ours. That coupled with the fact that a lot of them did not believe that this was something that would directly affect them or maybe it's not as serious as it sounds or, or the fact that this is being done to control them has definitely exacerbated the problem. We've seen a huge number of deaths, at least in the Somali community, but definitely also in other ethnic uh, minority and black groups. And that is not only because of issues like social deprivation and poverty and things like that, as well as pre-existing health conditions, but I definitely believe the, the conspiracy theories and the lack of timely, um, you know, accurate information in the initial stages at least definitely has a huge factor to play in the high rate of transmission within these kinds of populations. So these kinds of conspiracy theories is something I've been battling with from the beginning of this coronavirus pandemic. And a lot of it is based on zero facts. Anything that sounds dramatic and sensationalized seems to have traction for some reason. And for some reason, they always seem to come back into my WhatsApp groups because I also am part of a lot of these WhatsApp groups with the communities and the mosques and the elderly simply because I want to eradicate them at source. Now, I agree with one thing in life. We are human beings who have higher order of reasoning. We are intelligent human beings. I agree with Abdi and James in the sense that we really need to be skeptical when we're being given information. We need to critically analyze it for ourselves and not just be passive consumers of information. We need to do our own research, use our intelligence, speak to people and find out for ourselves and then come to our conclusions. Although I agree with that, I find it very hard to believe how people who have become, made a career out of being sensational conspiracy theorists can back any of their claims. And there's quite a few I've written down that I hope to go into later on um, in the first round, but particularly with regards to some of the things that have been mentioned. It's okay to be skeptical, but to be skeptical with, uh, with, without any basis and proof of such fantastical claims that have real world impact on people's lives is to me something that's beyond a joke. You really have to take things like that seriously. And you know, a lot of elderly folk or people who believe that you are of a certain social standing and therefore will passively consume information from you because you're either a doctor or you're a white man or because you are of, have some political power, will passively consume this information and take it as fact. So you really have to be careful the kind of information you're dictating. Yes, coronavirus not only has caused over 500,000 deaths in the world today, yes, it has also caused a massive economic decline at the moment and we're all facing massive recessions. Yes, it's cost livelihoods of several people, but it's also cost lives. So it comes down to where do you value? Where do you value you know, humanity at? Do you value the economy? Which I agree we do really need to make sure that we try and disrupt, or do you value human lives? 
if you can try to come to um, an end, so we're going to start the second round. So if you've got one more minute. All right, okay. So one minute's not going to cover it. But basically, all in all, what I'm going to say, and I'm sure we're going to have a really good discussions following this, is that regardless of what your theory of how it began is, it's a real issue. People are dying by the day. We're actually having talks of a second wave happening because things are being eased down from, from lockdown. And luckily for us, our, sister, our, our healthcare system in the UK, alhamdulillah, wasn't overwhelmed. And I suspect that is because, as Amina mentioned, we've managed to buy some time by slowing you know, human movement and human interaction. And if, unfortunately, that has had a knock-on effect on the economy. But if economy is your only, is your only focus and goal, then it, it's difficult to move this conversation forward because it's a matter of what you value more, the economy or human lives. Thank you so much, Samira. So that means we've come to an end in regards to our opening statements. We're going to go into the second round now. Um, it's not going to follow any alphabetical order. Um, this will be, um, so you have the chance to comment on anything that any of the other panelists have said. Um, if you want to comment on something that someone else has said specifically. Um, okay, Samira is saying that she wants to go ahead first. Um, just I had to hold myself back because I thought, you know, you have to do this in order. But I have so many questions to ask, but I'm going to try and, um, and, and minimize this. So um, when you're I asking the question, with, if you can try to stick to three to five minutes. So um, when you're asking the questions, try to st stay within three to five minutes so everyone gets. You well, know, my question will be 30 seconds long. I'm, I'm interested in the answer more than anything else. Okay. So I, I've got a few questions, but I'll start off with my question for James. So James actually eloquently articulated quite a lot of things I do believe in. What you've described, James, in terms of, you know, natural um, homeopathic healing and medicine is something I truly believe in. We call it in our... I don't believe in, a, I don't believe in homeopathic med uh, medicine. I believe in, I believe in alternative medicine. I don't believe in that whatsoever. Okay, fair enough. So uh, we believe in something called lifestyle medicine, which is essentially the essence of making sure that we get the basics right. Good diet, exercise, um, stress relieving methods and sleep. And that, as, as I truly believe in, is the root cause of a lot of medical ills today. So I definitely do agree with you in that, in that sense. But with regards to your point about um, you know, the, the lack of proof of that the virus doesn't exist because there is no electron micrograph photograph or there's no evidence that it's been isolated from a host and so many other things, my question to you is, as Amina mentioned, coronavirus is not a new thing. Coronavirus has existed in so many different other forms in the past. Um, did you have the questions for them then? Do you believe in the annual flu that epidemics that happen, um, not epidemics, sorry, endemics that happen and that people get vaccinated for? And do you believe that some conditions or illnesses can happen in, in, with, with regards to infective organisms that the eye can't see? Um, so with with any of ill health these are these are down to our own indiscretion through through bad lifestyle choices so okay. the flu the flu is no different from coronavirus to SARS to any other virus or any other outside sort of dangerous bug that's floating around it's, it's just there to kill us remember one thing nature doesn't make mistakes we make mistakes and before we start jumping on the virus bandwagon. And like, like you said, like you just said, you said, and again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm talking science, science here. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and keep this as formal as possible because once we start chucking the word uh, conspiracy theorists out, it sort of dumbs down the conversation. I think we're far more intelligent human beings that actually stop, stop going to those lengths to try and ridicule someone. I, I way Abdi was spoken to, I just feel it was very disrespectful towards him. But, just on you said that you said there's zero, zero facts, and you said human life is worth more than anything. Human life is worth more. Well, if human life is worth more, why did the government open up alcohol shops straight away? Why did the government open fast food restaurants straight away? Why do 1.2 million people a year die of tuberculosis and the world is not shut down? Why do 26,000 people a month die of the sea flu? And why do 50 million people a year die of heart disease? And we talk about, we talk about how so-called conspiracy theorists are actually causing more deaths and stuff, which is a very sensationalized accusation, especially in the comfort of their own. 
This is a fact. This has come from this comes from this has come from the government of USA. It says that the five cause of death in America is medical intervention. So when we're talking about is what's the price on human life? Well, people are going to hospital and people are dying. Half a million people. This is their own statistics. This is their own statistics. Now, we've got to be very careful when we talk about a coronavirus that's killed 40,000 people, because I know people in the NHS very high up. I know people in the pharmaceutical drug testing industry. And one thing I want to say to everyone here is that the mind is a very powerful thing. And sometimes the mind will trick you into being ill. And when you're getting told something, and you're, you're getting told it day in, day out, there's something called the placebo effect. And the placebo effect works very well. I've got, a, I've got a family. I'm not going to say what company she works for. But they do drug trials. And the drug trials come back the same as the placebo trial. They test one group with the actual drug they want to treat. The symptoms, not the cause. Because modern medicine, all they want to do is treat symptoms of ill health. They don't actually want to deal with the cause. Um, because there's no money to be made in that. Um, they want to deal with the symptoms. Um, and the placebo effect, she comes out as the same result as the drug uh, test. So when people, you know, when people talk about, well, there's people dying everywhere, there's people dying. Well, I would actually say to everyone this, is that most people are dying in care homes and hospitals. What drugs are you giving them? And what treatment care are these people given where they're going into hospitals and they're actually dying? These hospitals are designed to keep people alive. So why are these people dying? Why are these people being like flies in hospital? So cool, I don't work in hospitals, but I do know one thing, I know people do work in them, and the, the stats and the statistics which have been said are far different from the public, far different from what people in ground zero are saying. And if nurses are blind to do TikTok videos carrying body bags, and they've got time to dance around the hospital and do dance shows, where the choreography must take a week to do, that, that, that must, there must not be a pandemic of the proportions that we're talking about. And we've got the deaths of half a million people around the world, but that's nothing compared to cancer. It's nothing compared to tuberculosis. It's nothing compared to famine or lack of basic sanitation or nutrition. So before we start saying human life, and this is why we're shutting the country down, well, the country's the world's been open for hundreds and hundreds of years, and no one's given a toss about anything else apart from this illness. So anyway, I've just, I've just gone off from your question, but I do not believe in virus exists. And for you, there's zero evidence of a virus, and for, for your own medical institutions to not prove a virus exists, when you say that they can't even see it on an electro microscope, it just proves to me that we are, again, your theory is based on a theory. It's not concrete, it's not factual, and I have no to prove my justification of something when the med med medical establishment, which is a new age religion, which is a bigger religion than Islam and Christianity put together, well, Bill Gates is Jesus, and you guys are the priests, can go around and say what you want, and everyone else are just, don't know what they're talking about. When I've seen the power of individuals actually healing themselves from very, very uh, terrible and incurable diseases through fasting, through fresh air, through raw food, through, through natural means. So again, again, with zero facts, if we want to talk facts, let's talk facts. Let's make sure that you guys are telling the truth. You guys have your facts in place and make sure if you're going to show, tell us that coronavirus exists, again, it could exist. I'm not saying it doesn't, but if you want to tell me it exists, and show me the proof. Don't just tell me. I want you guys to show me the proof. And that's it. Okay. So my question to you, James, is, and I'll leave the, I'll let the other speak as well. Otherwise, it could be an ongoing debate. All yeah. night. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. It's, it's, all, love. it's all love, though. It's all love. It's all love. No, no, 100%. It's a really in interesting conversation to have. And I think it's important to have these debates where everybody's involved and not just the people I'm used to around me, like the medical field. And it improves cooperation and hopefully we come away learning something and understanding something better from a very deep perspective. Can you, there's a lot of questions, things you put in there and I don't want to touch upon every single one of them. No. 
you're right, coronavirus is not the highest rate of death. And I don't think anybody is saying that. And anybody who's saying that is factually wrong. And yes, there are other medical conditions that year in, year out cause high rates of death. And you're right. The numbers continue to remain as they are, or they do continue to increase. And yes, it begs the question, where's the government's care and input into that? But if you're also looking at the highest rates of deaths, alcohol and road traffic accidents are some of the highest as well. And road traffic accidents has got nothing to do with, with your health. You could just be killed by walking across the road. That, has, that is more right. likely to kill you than a heart attack. So if we're going to talk about highest rates of death, some things will happen even without any medical intervention, even if you're fit and healthy, even if you're practicing fasting and everything that you just mentioned. And yes, I do believe that intermittent fasting, fresh air, exercise heals a lot. I don't think it cures everything. It heals a lot and it allows your body to detoxify and regenerate itself in a way normal medical drugs won't do. So I do agree with that aspect. But where does the, you know, the fact that you don't believe coronavirus exists, my question to you is, so all these numbers and deaths that people are talking about every day in the news, if you don't believe they're dying of coronavirus, what do you think they're dying of? Well, in natural hygiene, and do you know what? You're a very, very uh, nice person to talk to. Is you're very humble and you're very, you're very, you're very neutral when you talk, and I, I love that because we could talk and not get angry for for, for hours and hours and hours. Well, I like that. Um, in natural hygiene, there's only two illnesses that exist. It, that is number one, toxemia, high levels of toxemia body, and number two is dehydration. Now. Government statistics have come out, government, government statistics have come out and they said diagnosis of respiratory and heart disease has decreased during the coronavirus outbreak. Um, they, they have said that the annual death rate in London itself has decreased, has decreased during the coronavirus epidemic. This is on the own, their own government websites. Um, I do not, I do not believe for one second that a virus or bacteria or germs are designed to actually harm a human or a vertebrate animal of any sort. I reckon, I, well, I know through experience and also studying for the last 10 years that bacteria, germs and viruses, that crazy word viruses, actually help and aid the, the healing of the body, not actually the, the, um, the killing of the body. And I, I'll, I'll explain this further. In order to test the cheapest way for cancer, they say take a pregnant test because it, it shows a, a huge, a huge levels of cellular activity in the body, just the same as a pregnancy as in cancer. And when they test for antibodies, all they're testing for is high levels of cellular activity in the body. Um, cells create their own bacteria in order to, to, to break down disease and dead tissue. And, and that's what bacteria's job is. Bacteria has the same function in soil, same function in, in uh, it's the same function in sewage, in the same function in all of nature. Bacteria is, bacteria's job or germ's job is to help a breakdown of dead or diseased tissue. This is why the cycle of life is so important. And this is what keeps us together. This is what keeps life from living and dying, breaking down, and it keeps going round. So in order to answer the question, no, I don't believe there's an A virus because there has never been a virus in medical history which has been isolated from the human body and extracted through flu or blood tests. And I've looked at all your medical journals and I cannot find one. I can't even find a picture, not one single picture. So there has to be another cause. Now, if people are so concerned about the virus but not concerned about what they consume on a day-to-day -day basis, then I would actually find this more plausible. But the fact that we can consume high levels of processed, dehydrate, um, uh, inorganic, uh, dead food on a daily basis and not question our own reasoning behind why we're getting sick and blame it on these so-called little bugs that are around in the air, then we have serious problems because like you said, we need to move forward. And by moving forward, we have to take full responsibility for our health. I was in the supermarket and I've seen pe overweight people with masks on and cans of beer. I don't drink alcohol. I don't ever smoke. I've never drunk alcohol. I've never done none of this, but the hypocrisy in people's behavior is ridiculous. And how do we, 
if the government are so concerned about alcohol abuse, why do not ban in alcohol? Because alcohol, again, destroys communities, it creates social breakdown, and again, it's a fantastic tool to control people. And a great, a great guy, Dick Gregory, says, you ban alcohol, you'd have the army on the streets tomorrow. But again, no, I don't believe a virus exists, and I do not believe it is a virus. We should be questioning the treatment that the people are receiving in hospitals, the drugs they're taking, because if half a million people in America, by the US government's own statistics, are dying of medical intervention, and that's what they're only telling you, how many, how many more millions or thousands of people are dying every year of medical intervention? So this is the question I ask you. How can, how can the government or science or big pharma cannot prove the existence of a virus? And again, it's not up to me to prove it. It's up to you guys to show me the evidence that suggests that. And if they can show me evidence, I will quite gladly jump on the coronavirus bandwagon and I will, I, I will, I will, I will accept it for what it really is. But until then, I can't. So you believe bacteria exist, but you don't believe viruses ever existed in any form? The vac vaccines, are, the vaccines are a part of the germ theory that exists. And a vaccine, to me, again, is a, a, a science which is flawed. Um, it's completely flawed. But again, it's another, another topic we might have to have, because otherwise we're going to go off topic with that as well. Oh, no, can I come in? Uh, I mean, well, uh, I just remember you said to me, oh, I haven't got no one, you, I don't know no one that passed away. Actually, two of my uncles did pass away uh, very close to me of this so-called COVID. Obviously, they were, they, were over, they were over 80 years old and they had, they had a lot of underlying illness, so he, they went in there and they just never came out. He, and, and, and surprisingly, it was, it was, it was, they died of COVID. But... Uh, the thing I don't understand is, I remember right at the beginning of uh, when all this stuff started, and remember that Boris Johnson does, does a daily briefing uh, uh, at five o'clock, and you got the scientists standing next to him. Right at the beginning, he said, he said, uh, 2018, 2019, a, uh, a man flu killed 28,000 in this country. So we we we're looking to if we keep it in that in that in in that level twenty eight thousand we had that means we had a, we had a, we, we we were successful so that's that's number one a question uh, uh, to to answer the other thing is uh, uh, before before Theresa May left uh, I don't know if you like, you guys remember she, she was talking about uh, 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 how the elderly or, or elderly homes were costing the British government 15 billion a year. Very surprising, a lot of elderly people are dying. I mean, this comes down to, it comes down to money. Uh, and the other thing, I, mean, I don't know, you, 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 you said something about uh, Northfield Park Hospital, uh, and I saw it on, 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 on the British media, they were saying, oh, that's the worst hospital in, in the NHS, it's getting, it's getting bom bombarded. I remember, I, no, I remember they were saying that on, on, on LBC or on the radio, I remember. And it's strange because my first cousin, I don't know if you know Hinda Diri, she works there, she works in A&E. So I rang her, obviously, I was concerned, I rang her, I said, Hinda, what's going on in your hospital? She, she, she FaceTimed me, she goes, look, I'm in A&E and there's one patient. This, this is the, right in the beginning, when, you know, when it was peak, she goes, there's one patient, what, they, what they're telling in, in, in the news is, is rubbish. I can fight her because I, I just... I just said her name there. So, and I think I'm in logistics in business, so, so I'm always driving around in, in and out of London. And it's very strange how they were saying, uh, they were talking about uh, uh, social distancing, but every, every, every police, or police van you see, there's 12 police officers. They've got 12 families, they've got how many kids, and every time I ask them, how come you guys are not allowed to social distance, they will never answer me that question. I've, 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 I've asked them in, on recordings, I've asked them, and they said, oh, he, the government told us, would I have to? Is that, that's, that's another question. So when, when you hear all this stuff that's, that's, that's going on, it's, it's very, very strange, very, very strange. Okay, Abdi, I heard you. I'm going to answer you for a bit. I just want to like highlight a point that James was talking about, what's it called, fasting and eating holistic and all of that, and some, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, this, I just want to, uh, Somali, Somali people, you know that the Somali nomad will fast Monday and Thursdays. He eats like what? You know, no meat, 
no oil, little sugar, and you know, the virus did hit the whole of Africa and our nomads who are meant to be one of some of the healthiest people in our society are dying from this. So the thing is, at the end of the day, I mean, Samira and Selma have put everything that I wanted to say in such an eloquent manner. The reason why I'm angry, at is because I, a healthcare worker, who, there's two different types of uh, what's it called healthcare workers. There are people who have been dragged from their daily life and have been extracted and we've put in the most critical bit. And we're seeing what the virus is doing to the human body. Now, if I said to you, I've got 13 years of experience. I've seen COVID-1, I've seen MERS. I was in Saudi when MERS was happening and I was here when SARS was happening. And, and I see this, it's Kamid Maha. It is not the, it isn't, it's not the same. What this virus is doing to the human body is something like we haven't seen before. I'll give you a very good example. We all know what our phlegm looks like, right? You know what phlegm looks like. Phlegm can be white, phlegm can be green, it can be sticky. Now, tell me why is something that just looks like flubber, like gelatin, is coming out of someone's lungs. And that's the kind of nonsense that we were dealing with, okay? So this virus only okay? But what I'm saying to you is now, as a society, as a humanity, as that, we are now in the middle of like a pandemic. So we have two ways of dealing with it. We can be team, hey, you know what? This thing's not gonna affect me. I'm gonna carry on doing whatever from my position of privilege. And we know damn well that we have poor people in our society, that we have vulnerable people in our society. The virus hit the most vulnerable. Someone asked me this question, why didn't the rich people die? And I said, good question. Because the rich people are eating good, okay? They live in big houses, they live in big spaces. They've got a garden, they've got running water, they've got heat, you know, they've got heaters. You know, they're, they're living good. The people who are dying are vulnerable. We talked about the elderly. Yes, you're right. They did say that the elderly are a big burden on our healthcare system. Of course, the elderly died. Listen, all it did is if you were a sick person, like I'll give you a very good example as how one of some of our youngest patients have died. Say that you're a, you're a young kid recovering from the flu. Okay, your immune system is already quite weak. All it had to take was a little fat, tiny bit of corona and then you get infected and then it kills you off. Okay, so there's no, literally, there's no telling how this virus hits you. There's no telling how this virus hits you. Now, I'm part of the privileged crew, okay? Apart from being a health worker, alhamdulillah, I've got a very good life. Now, I had the, I've, I've got the choice to go out there, not listen to anyone, not wear a face mask, not, you know, social distance, but I did not. I was worried about my ayayo. I was worried about somebody else's ayayo. As Selma put it, this the only way to beat this virus is if we come together as a collective and follow what rules that need to be followed. Because if Haddam Muslimin and Haddam Somalin, it is not the first time that we followed these set of rules. If the Sahabas were following these rules in God knows when, 1400, who are we to say, you know what, this doesn't add up to me. Why is a policeman not social distancing? Now it's impossible to have a population of 60 million people to socially distance. It is impossible. We're not going to be all behave the same way, okay? So what's it called? Regarding the point of your cousin who was in a &E, listen, of course a &E was dead. Our a &E was dead. People were scared to come to hospital, okay? And as a result, we are seeing, now what we're dealing with, like to say someone had a heart block, we are seeing like some of the worst heart blocks that we've seen in a very long time because... People didn't seek medical attention straight away. It got so bad. Now, if you look a few weeks, a few months ago, and Samira will tell you this as well, where A and E departments had to say to patients, "We are still open." Okay, they were saying, "We are still open. Please come." We were, people were so scared because of this coronavirus, because of this stories that they would hear. You know, the hospitals were do what was it planting a chip on you we're testing on you where um, the vaccination and whatnot where all this crazy stuff people were scared to come to hospitals and this is why the a the a and e units were quiet okay so yes that is a very true story but then that's because of the fear of the, that was generated through all of this false narrative regarding covid so the thing is the one thing that is just always going to stay with me, I always will remember, it will be people who, from the comfort of their homes, the thing is, you have to understand, living in this country, you've got a lot of like safe, safety networks that will catch you when you fall, that are not available in Africa. And they might no, that may not be available to every single hospital, okay? So in, in the UK, you have the NHS that worse comes to worst if you like fighting for your dying breath, your family member will call 999, Come and pick, and they'll come and pick you up, and they'll fix you. Or if they don't fix you, at least you will be given a fighting chance at life. Okay? But what this false narrative has done, Addi, in our community, a community that already mistrusts 
everybody. So Malida, we don't follow the British system. We don't follow the Muslim, we're not connected to the British system, okay? We're not connected, we're not connected to our uh, BME and black and, you know, black, 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 black system. And we're not connected to the Muslim, you know, councils. We're not connected to any of them. So the information that our people were getting was from us. And for some strange reason, right? Fake news and sensationalized news was the one that was making the WhatsApp rounds, was the one that was making, you know, everyone saying, and you know how our people talk. Why, who are they? Why, yo? Talk to us. All we're saying is, that the people who've been there from day one who were seeing this, okay? Now, you could talk about organic food and a fasted and this. People, he's saying that our people don't fast. I don't know. Are I've never saying, been there. Ish. I think I'm with, okay? The thing is, as well, this, when we talk about this virus, we have to remember that this virus has affected society in two different ways. It has affected the black and ethnic minorities in a different way, in such a way that basically we, for the first of a time, the government is conducting a review as to why there's so many of us that are dead. And then it's also why, what's so called? Oh, Amina, please, um, Amina. Government, government has never ever done nothing for, 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 for ethnic minorities. Of why course, of course, of course, of course, of course. But because of this, because of the higher than usual proportionate numbers, who would, name me the five first people that died. What, five doctors? The first people, the first five people that died were all Muslim, were all black, were all men. We're all from BME, okay? And they were all in the medical field. One I personally knew. One was a good friend of mine. And one was the surgeon. So when you're coming at me, of course, yeah, the government didn't do anything. The government, this government has never done it. This is the Tories that we're talking about. They've well, never in done general, anything. In general, government has never ever done nothing for it. They always, they always um, tarnish the, the black and ethnic minorities anyway. So that nothing, if they, if they stay on the media, oh, it's going to affect you guys. It, Which is why them opening a review on why BME community members have died should be a thing that ooh, blows your mind. It is the first ever time. It well, is the, you're saying this well, never nothing, happened, but what I'm saying is they've opened the review. And for nothing will come up from that review. Nothing will come up from that review. Hmm? Nothing will come up from the review if, if conservative government are doing it anyway. So they couldn't care less about ethnic minorities. Listen, Ilaha only God knows what's going to come out of it. But to me, the very action is actually, I, was, I looked at it, I was a little bit like, huh, interesting. I was approached at work. Do you feel, uh, as, a, as, as, as a person of color, do you feel like you're at risk? Uh, do, you want us, do you want us to pull you out? Are you okay? And that was after when? That was after the ITV, ITV review, I, the ITV report and review. And then they were like, maybe we should start pulling black and ethnic minority people out of the frontline workforce and maybe put them in the offices to reduce the number of deaths. Okay, so there's so much that's happened. What I'm saying to you, I think what I'm saying to you, is, had that so much, had that 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 kind of cover, what is it, Makushega? You have no place sharing a conspiracy theory. Yes, kafakar. Yes, it's wedi. That's you know, that's the very essence of being tena. Like in Abdi, Marke, but that kind of demanian, and you know that kind of demanian for bila mina reasons. Bila mina reasons. That's when you stop and you say, and the only thing I'm amenian, police can I'm amenian. You, okay? So, Marka, when people like you are saying my virus can be real, then are they adding a quote? I mean, you know, the hard that you're adding on your own, you're a lot of strong. What the world is going on? You're about Afghan, Afghan, and then I'm a synonym. This thing is fake. Then you are complicit. This is why I am pissed off. Okay, Amina. because the thing is, we, this is the one thing I was like, Abdi, give it one second. I just want to hear from Ikram. Ikram, can you just tell us how you think these, um, you know, floating, these theories about coronavirus, how they've affected people back in Somalia and what impact it's had? Um, it's like Samira and Amina has been saying, there have been numerous WhatsApp groups, there is social media, well, whether it be a Facebook, whether it be Instagram, Twitter, just anything and everything. And, and our people, like they said, they don't believe in the police department. They don't, in Somali, they don't believe in 
because they say that they haven't done anything for us. So what they'll believe is a person sending them a message. And I honestly wrote down a list of the conspiracy theories that have been heard of in Somalia, not even through what, like just WhatsApp and just everything. Um, one, when the whole Corona thing happened early February for us, people were running from China. We have a lot of medical students in Somalia, in some, from Somalia, in China, especially whether it be Wuhan, Guangzhou, Beijing, all those cities. Our students ran to come to Somalia, right? They came to Hamar, and the government locked up the first two boys that came from China. Not only did they not search them, and not only did they not, you know, actually test them for coronavirus, they locked them up, put them in a hotel room, and they came out the next day saying, Wilkas, Wilkas, they both have coronavirus. Whether it, it, and it being straight up lies, knowing that I know the boys personally. Um, so people started thinking, you know what, the government is doing this because, you know, the WHO said, if you can find cases, you'll get money. And that people were just doing this. People were just actually counting cases and saying, hey, we have case one, case two, case three, just to receive money. Another one was that the virus is for non-believers. If you're not Muslim, or the kukukudaya. If you're Muslim, then you won't have the virus. The virus won't happen to you. You'll never see it, and it'll never attack you or your loved ones. And it was false. Me being a medical student, they stopped our university, made us stop coming to the hospitals and to the universities February, March. Um, and for me, obviously, I felt like I, it was my part of my duty to tell my, pe my family members or people that I find, you know, my loved ones and everyone that say, hey, you know, so let's at least stop let's going out as much you know be careful let's take certain precautions and you know what i got hit with i got hit with you're not dean to said that you don't know the religion i got hit with yes Ikhwan, sorry in in terms of somalia how would how was people when they were telling people uh you stay at home how were they their daily life how were they surviving they okay thing was like i said curfew only happened from Maghrib, like which was 6 p.m. until early uh, Fajr, which is 5 a.m., right? People did not listen to the government at all. It came to the point where the police had to come to every restaurant with, like, have you, I don't know, have you ever been to Somalia, Abdi? You've seen Askirta Gadi, how they're on their cars, right? They actually <laughs> bought canes. They bought canes so they can beat people to go into their houses because people were not listening. People were not listening. You, they, but the thing is, they go out early in the morning. Everyone's out doing, you know, God knows what. Well, you can't, you can't blame them. Because um, a remind, they... Listen, just a reminder to everyone. I get it. English. So let's try to. Stick. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I understand all of it. I understand all of it. Don't worry. Carry on. <laughs> I'm sorry, James. Hey, this is my say. second. This is my second tongue. I, I love it. Just yeah, carry yeah. on. It's fine. Oh, I think it would be it would have been easy if they if they gave every single household a rations. Uh, then then maybe they would they, they'd have to come out to, to and 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 they they live in because obviously you know that in Somalia they, they they live they live uh, wherever they make that day they go go buy their stuff uh, and then they they go home. So it's strange. I remember uh, I think it was it was it was Rwanda that that that. Uh, that gave gave rations. I think two months worth of rations every every house or every village, and and they didn't have, they didn't have to come out. But obviously, with 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 with, with Somalia and Somalia, and I've heard that he, you know, a lot of supplies did did come from from he, I think Saudi, I think Turkey, and some other country, and 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 certain rations will go missing, you know. And if yep. if if if, if, if uh, Aslante Ramesh, that's selling the potatoes on the street. She has to come out regardless of any any illness on her because she's got kids that's, that's, that needs feeding at home. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's another. She has another. kids feeding. Imagine people that live in the IDP camps that rely on two dollars or three dollars just to get their meal of the day. Can they stay home for two months without food? Can no they? Chance. No chance. It's it's not it's it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, I'm going to go on to another um, conspiracy theory: the heat. I live in Bolsaso, right? So Bolsaso is located on the Gulf of Adam. So it's as we have the same temper, we'll feel the same temperatures as Dubai or Saudi. It will get really hot. Um, so people used to say, oh, since we're in Bolsaso, the virus won't affect us as much, you know, if, you, if compared to the other cities in Somalia, whether you're going to Hargeisa, whether you're going to Garoa, whether you're going to um, Mogadishu, that the virus won't affect you as much because you're in the heat, which is not true. 
there were so many cases in the city itself. And like Abdi said, there were so many other countries that were bringing in equipment. I think for our city, we got our equipment from um, Dubai. Um, I think Hamad got its equipment as well. Muqtasha got its equipment as well. But the thing was as well, we do have to know when I was talking about the four cases that we had before, Somalia was so late, so late to have equipment that it was sending its testing to Kenya. We had to wait four days for the plane to lift off, bring it to Kenya, test those samples, and then bring back those results. Because of that, it spread so quickly. Um, and well, it's, 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 there's many more. If you guys want to share, what other conspiracy theories have you guys heard of Like that's actually been in our community? I, What's up? The whole... Do you know what? Do you know, I've been friends with Ishmael. I've been friends with Abdi for nearly 10 years. And I, I actually see him as one of my best friends. And uh, I would probably, as a Somali community, I'm not a part of it. But with Abdi, this guy would die for me. So I feel like I'm his brother way. Um, because this guy would, would walk through uh, hot coals just to help me out. I would, I still haven't, from all this conversation, I still haven't, from anyone in the medical profession, no one's actually answered my question on why they haven't proved this virus exists or any virus and why they haven't proved it in their own medical journals. No one actually, um, Amina, I, I would like you to explain what the treatment that you're using on, what's the treatment, what's the protocol, what what type of treatment, what type of drugs are you guys using on these patients? And, and thirdly, if we're saying, and I would say thirdly, if you think that the pharmaceutical industry is there for our benefit, why are they trading for profit? If a company's trading for profit, it needs sick people. If, there was ever, if everyone was healthy, they would have no money, they would have no business, they would make no money at all. So can someone actually answer the question? Again, I'm looking just, I'm, I'm just talking in general. Why haven't they isolated or extracted the virus? And why haven't they proved the virus exists? And, and secondly, what types of treatment they use in the hospital in order for people? To, and, and, and last thing on the black and Asian community, the black and Asian community, unfortunately, have on the diet compared to in, in Western in Western, the, the Asian and black communities have very bad diets. And I, I, I hate to say it, but their diet very bad, full of spices. The food's very rich, um, especially in Indian, Indian and Asian communities as well. So I would say that a lot more deaths occur in ethnic minorities because of their bad lifestyle choices, and I'll say that as well. Um, but can someone ask, uh, answer me that? Answer me a question, Amina, on the treatment that you're giving to patients. In so, okay. Hospitals? On the treatment, on the treatment. So one of the one of the fake theories that was going on was that when we go to, when when patients come to hospital, uh, don't go to hospitals because they will vaccinate you and then they will uh, we will they will but, give you this. But this is not, vaccination is not ready anyway. Yeah. Vaccine is not ready anyway. Exactly. Well, number one. So exactly. So this actually helped us and said actually there is no vaccine and guess what there is no treatment. All we were doing on in the ICU give a mixture of just the regular antibiotics little to little bit of fluids and put them on the ventilator help you know like um, um, oxygen and oxygen so that's what the ventilator does is a breathing tube and from that breathing tube is connected to a machine that delivers oxygen to you because patients will the, the initial presentation was just very low oxygen levels and they were struggling to breathe understand and it just it was just a wait and see and see how your body deals with it so some of these people have been on the ventilator for about two months three months Okay, and it was just a case of us just watching and just seeing what happens and how their body responds to it and just hoping that your body does the rest. So you're right. Well, well you're, you're saying where is to the treatment and what's it called? From where, what we've learned more from um, coronavirus, we're learning more, subhanAllah, from the autopsies that we are performing. The dead is teaching us. And this is how we're learning more as to what this virus is doing to the body. I think from a medical point of view, like Samira maybe can back me up on this, because of the rate, the, the fast rate that this virus spreads in, it's nature, it's very contagious nature. I think we've just prioritized trying to save as many lives as possible, save as many lives as possible. And as, at the same time, there's all this research, there's all this, um, you know, um, trial and testing and this, that's happening just to try and understand why this virus, this novel coronavirus is completely different to his cousins. OK, and also called and also called at the same time, you know, and behind the scenes, the scientists are working on vaccine and God knows what, which won't be ready. How, so there's, there's so a big 
there is a big fear. Let me finish. There is a big fear about, right. the, about, about the vaccine. So the vaccine, listen, if you look at the history of vaccines, no vaccine was created in one month. No vaccine was created in two months. There needs to be a lot of trials. There needs to be a lot of things. And the thing is, this is the first time that from a scientific point of view, we are asking scientists and medical companies and pharmaceutical companies for accountability. So the thing is, it was a very cute little thing yesterday. Of course, it's going to be mistrust where they say that uh, there's the vaccine that's available for the black and ethnic minorities. Now, I know for a fact, no black and ethnic minority will go for that vaccine at all because if the, the theory is last to get tested, but first to be experimented on. And this again goes back to the mistrust between the authorities and the uh, between the authorities and people of color. Understand? So there's not going to be anything that's available for a bit. Uh, there is no treatment. The health minister said that he said we, we're gonna we first thing comes up we're gonna test it on on ethnic minorities. Yeah, yeah, that was that was that was the headline point, yesterday. That Hong Kong said that. I don't think point blank, he said it. He, he said it, yeah, yeah, that is. You can, you can Google it. You can Google it. And I think this is their way. This, this is, again, this government is a bit, you know, a uh, bit thick. This is their way of trying to thinking, maybe appeasing the black and ethnic minority by saying, oh, you're going to be the first people to have the thingy, but there is already a big massive mistrust. Ain't How nobody, no black man's going to go for it. Sec, what was the How other question, James? Oh, my, again, my question is, how can you, again, is this is an add-on from my first question. You're breaking up, regarding... I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, you're breaking good? up. That's not good. That's not good. Can everyone else hear me I at all? I can hear you a bit better now. Okay, I just answered the better. question. How can, you, how can you trial a vaccine for a vaccine which they've never proven exists? Can I just, I, can I just let Samira have that one. Sam, you go. Okay. There's, first of all, let's just start off by saying these, a lot of these questions, the questions that James and, and Abdi are asking are very valid questions because a lot of people actually think that way or a lot of people have these genuine questions and a lot of people deserve answers. So first of all, I like these kind of debates because it increases understanding between the two. Secondly, I want to pay respects and my condolences to Abdi. I know you mentioned your uncle's passed away. And we have to remember in all of this and all of our statements and all of our conversations, people are dying by the day, whether it's because of coronavirus, coronavirus related deaths or whatever the causes are, real people are dying and real people are hurting. So I just want to pass my condolences and respects to everybody who's lost a family member in this pandemic. So that, that's the first thing. The other thing, um, James, there was quite a number of things you said, but it, it, this could easily be a conversation me and you can have, I think, till the sun cows come home. So I didn't want to hug the mic, but essentially touching up on your fundamental question, whether you believe this virus exists or not because it's not been seen, it's not been isolated, that's not entirely true. There's many other things you said, but let me start off with that. Electron microscope pictures have been seen of this virus. It does, it, these pictures do exist. So if that's your basis as to believing whether a virus exists or not, they have. These electron micrographs have been used not only to visualize the virus, but to study its um, antibody receptors, to study um, all the antigens on its surface so that we are able to target future vaccine vaccinations or treatments to it, and also to understand how these antibody receptors or how these antigens on its outer lining are actually affecting and infecting the cells. So all of these oh. obviously takes a long time to come through. So they do exist. Yeah, the next question okay. is whether they've been just, isolated. Just, just, sorry, sorry, just, just that, what you just said there, because a virus will take its own certain shape and form. Um, a virus is very easily identified as its own virus because of its shape and form. If that's the case, they, these, these viruses, they've seen them and they have their own unique shape and form. How come they've never been isolated from body fluids or blood? Tests? I was going to come back to, that was my second okay, point. Sorry. So yes, they have been isolated. So there's two things, James. Viruses do have their own shape, shape or form, but in the very nature of most viruses, especially if you studied virology, what they tend to do is they have the original shape or form as the virus. And then when they are attacking a host cell, they merge into the cellular membrane of the host cell only because they want to be able to inject the DNA genetic material into the cell that gets incorporated in the DNA of the host cell. And that's how it forces the cell to develop the proteins and the, and the different polymerase chains that it requires for it to survive. So it no longer keeps its shape once it enters the host cell, but it does have a shape initially and there are actually some viruses that don't even have an envelope so the way that they are actually confirmed to exist is your next question have they been isolated and yes they have been 
all these tests and, and, and the way it's been isolated in the first place are through the genetic material. The reason why they just don't rely on looking at the virus on, under an electron microscope, which is the only way you can look at a virus because they're much tinier than bacteria. The only reason they didn't rely on that is because they require the gen it's the actual genetic material that's the, that's the pathogen, not just the envelope of the, of the virus itself. So the, the genetic material has been isolated through something called polymerase chain reaction, if I remember correctly, PCR. So the swab test that they've been, they've been doing and the, and the subsequent antibody test that they've been doing. So the antibody test doesn't look for the virus itself. It just looks for your body's reaction to it, which is the antibodies. And I, and I, I take that point. But the initial swab test that, that shows people they are actually infected at this moment in time and why they're saying some people are coronavirus positive and some are not is through the isolation of this genetic material and then they use something called the PCR mechanism, the polymerase chain reaction mechanism, to amplify this genetic material. So they're actually going to be able to see it and, and, and test, test these medications or these vaccines on it. So yes, oh. you can, can be isolated. But, but okay, okay. And, that, and, and again, again, it, it sounds very plausible, but again, through your own medical literature, through your own medical literature, there's three, re, there's three components of actually actually uh, char characterizing a virus and these are the three things and they haven't done it and i've looked in all the medical literature and there's no proof that they've actually done this so done which again, bit i just explained to you two things that they've done so which bit no, but i i I'm, I'm actually saying that in order to prove that a virus is, this is in your own medical literature they have to isolate the virus from the whole cell they have to photograph it through a micro micro which uh, they have. microscope Okay, they have, but can you send me that information? Would you I'm be happy, able to send I'm me happy that send If I get your contact details, I'll send it through to you. Would you be able then, to, to, to the people who are watching on Facebook, to actually put a link showing the, showing the proof that they've actually done this? Because again, it's not, again, it's not for us to prove my theory, it's up for you guys to prove your theory. It's to bring out the is, facts. This has this is destroyed millions of people's lives, not just through the shutdown the tree, but mental health, the breakdown of, of family, um, what does to our children and future generations to come. It's created a it's it's created such a hysteria. And again, we talk about how deadly uh, coronavirus is, but then I, I I keep referring back to T B, which is a very uh, a very serious disease which kills one point two million people. And but no one seems to but an okay, so okay, James, James, one thing I want to, uh, let me stop you there. And uh, you've mentioned these points before, and I definitely want to be able to address them because they are all very valid, plausible questions. Now, the first bit I wanted to tackle was the fact that you wanted proof because of the fact that you need to isolate. And uh, of course, it's, this is not religion. We have a lot of things that we take on faith and face value. But with science and medicine, we need proof and we need the ability to be able to constantly prove that our theory is correct or, or what we're saying is correct to, for it to remain sustainable. So yes, they have been able to see it under electron microscope. Yes, they have been able to isolate it via PCR. Okay. So that's the first two things. Second point I wanted to um, mention to you is, yes, you're right. You mentioned things like um, high rates of deaths from TB, um, cardiovascular disease, strokes, even something like road traffic accidents. Alcohol is, an, is, is a major component to it. Alco uh, smoking is as well. Uh, but they're not all mutually exclusive, uh, uh, you know, exclusive to say that, you know, the world doesn't care or the government doesn't care, which I sometimes believe that a lot of things are driven by economy. I do believe that a lot of governments are driven by economy and politics is a very dirty game. And I know that there are some people who just don't have the best interests of human at heart. I, I take that on face value. I think a lot of us are not naive enough to believe that everybody wants us to do well. But what I'm saying is the fact that you can have high numbers of deaths because of road traffic accidents has no bearing on what's happening with coronavirus whatsoever. The fact that you're having high numbers of deaths because of TB and alcohol has no bearing on coronavirus. So these things are not mutually exclusive. You mentioned that natural hygiene's main principles is that um, the, the body becomes imbalanced because of all the things such as processed foods and, and the lack of exercising and good diet and all of that, which essentially causes toxemia and dehydration. These are the two main components of ill health. I agree with you. And, and I know modern medicine doesn't speak in those terms. But essentially, every single medical condition, whether it be diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, whether it be even something like autoimmune conditions, is based on essentially an imbalance in the metabolism, the hormones, which releases inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory hormones, which causes a death and destruction to a lot of cells in the body. And essentially, that is what toxemia is. 
not exactly in the scientific term, but in the broad sense. It is this imbalance of the metabolic um, in, in hormones and the inflammatory structures that are released by all these processed foods and all the, you know, the long-term effects of bad exercise and, and stress and all of that. Yes, so it's not mutually exclusive. We are on the same page when it comes to natural hygiene, which I call lifestyle medicine, because that is the fundamentals of health. People back in the days when you know, technology haven't existed and they were relying on growing their own crops and their own food, organic food, a lot of them were, I believe, a lot healthier than us today who have access to fast foods and McDonald's and all of that, simply because healthy diets are part and parcel of our building blocks and developing our cells and you know, cellular activity relies on a lot of nutrients, minerals and chemicals, natural chemicals that are found in normal everyday food. And yes, that is the cycle of life. We believe this is given to us by God, whether you believe this is just part of the universe. It's all, I think, going back to the same fundamental aspect. So what, part, what part do drugs and vaccines... I'll come, I'll come to that in a minute. The, the, part, the fact that you mentioned that drug interventions do kill people, I agree. There are a lot of side effects. Sometimes side effects can be death itself that is caused by drugs. And yes, you're right. Sometimes we rush to give people medications before solving things through actual lifestyle changes and dietary changes, which is why this whole new movement of lifestyle medicine, which started in medicine, has come across to places like Britain and, 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 the, and the rest of Europe. And it's a growing movement. People have to go back to the basics of health. And I, I do agree with you. But that has no bearing on coronavirus deaths. You know, all the arguments you're making, I agree with the fundamentals of it. But it, they're not mutually exclusive. And the other thing you mentioned is, Cells create their own bacteria. I find that a very interesting theory. I don't know where that came from because that's the first time I've heard of it. Because, but, I but, believe in, I'll just finish this point. I do yeah, believe in, in good bacteria and bad bacteria. You're right. We rely on our millions and millions and millions. I think they say partly half, half the cellular content in our body is good bacteria. We rely on them for good gut, gut health, which, which affects our hormone level, which affects our homeostasis which affects our metabolism, and it even affects our mental health. There's been studies to show that poor gut health and poor bacterial imbalance can also affect your mental health. So yes, we do have good bacteria in almost every part of our body, but there is such a thing as pathogens. When they become pathogens, when do they become pathogens? A, when, you're, when you have organisms in your body or you manage to ingest organisms in your body that are not meant to be there. There's so many living organisms in the universe. They're not meant to be in certain places, which is what causes deaths and problems for certain people. The fact that we've had mass, mass migrations because of technology over the years has caused problems for some people. Some people are more likely to have autoimmune conditions because they've moved to the Western countries when their natural genetic and metabolic homeostasis and, and the genetics of their forefathers were living in Africa, for example. Yes, that does have an effect. But saying that, again, it doesn't prove your point that coronavirus doesn't exist. And you, you mentioned the hypocrisy of people um, who cover their face masks, but then drink alcohol at the same time. I agree with you. Health is one big sphere. You can't take away from one and then protect the other and expect to be healthy. I do agree with you. And a lot of people have a lot of bad habits. They don't eat well, even though they know they should. They, they smoke, they drink alcohol, they don't exercise. But it does not mean that coronavirus does not cause high rates of morbidity, which is sickness, and high rates of mortality in some people because of pre-existing conditions. And, and you're right. The people who are far more vulnerable when it comes to coronavirus are people who are already teetering on the edge with regards to their health. They, were, they already had fatty, um, you know, level, high levels of cholesterol and, and atherosclerosis, which is the buildup of cholesterol in their blood vessels. Their, their heart was already under immense pressure because of the high numbers of fat or salt or blood pressure. The, the brains and the circulatory and their kidney and the liver systems were already under massive pressure because they're literally filling it with all kinds of junk, whether it be alcohol, smoking, processed foods. So they're already teetering on the edge. And like Amina said, it takes something as simple as an extra virus, like flu, because flu kills, like TB, TB kills, like even this current COVID-19, because it is a coronavirus, but it's a specific type. It's called SARS-CoV-2. So let's mention that particularly. It just takes that to take some people over the edge. But if your theory is that it only affects people who have health problems, then that's not right, because we've sadly seen a few children who have developed massive immune response that ended up killing them. An eight-month, healthy eight-month-old baby, unfortunately, died in the UK because of it. We've had young, a young boy, who I think he was eight or nine years old, who's died because of it, who had no pre-existing health condition. We had a few 20 to 25-year-olds who've died who have had no pre-existing Where did they die? Where did they die? At home or in hospital? 
So I, I believe they all, they, they, all the young people we've mentioned have died in hospital. Do you believe it's a hospital intervention that's caused them then? Is that, does that prove you, that theory? I, 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 like I said, with the statistics that, that, that the uh, US government comes out and says half a million people a year, it's just on the same scale. Who's to say that? They do. You know, I have actually put on death certificates, death because of surgical procedures. I've actually it, put it myself. That does so, exist. But so it doesn't we, everybody who ends up going into hospital dies because of a direct medical intervention. Right, let me ask you, let me ask you a question then. Let me ask you a mm -hmm. question. So you're, if, if, if coronavirus exists in the form that you say it does, do you believe that every single person that's died in the, the hands of the medical institution have all died from a virus, not medical intervention, when the statistics that and you've said people have died from medical intervention and you've put it on certificates, you're saying that no one and your belief is that they've all died from this virus and not from medical intervention and the process of putting toxic chemicals into the body has not actually actually tipped them over the edge rather than the symptom because all we're talking about is a collection of symptoms that exist in the body fever uh sweat loss of loss of uh loss of taste buds and all these collective symptoms but we're not actually talking about causes and we're talking about a cause of a virus, but again, I would, I would love you, and I would actually give that to every single one of you, Ikram, Amina, and, and, and Abdi. If anyone can show me that they've actually isolated this virus and extracted it, I would believe you 110%, but until that point, James, I cannot. If you Google cannot, PCR, you'll see how they've, they've isolated the genetic material, which is the essential. I've tried. I've tried. I've tried, and I've, I've been okay. searching for it for weeks and weeks, and when I can't find anything in their medical literature. Um, when, when a pharmaceutical industry, especially with Bill Gates, who is the Jesus Christ uh, forthcoming, who, who spouts around the world and he's got lawsuits in Africa, he's got lawsuits in India. He is a multi-billionaire with no formal education. He's not a scientist. He doesn't even have actually own a degree unless he paid for it. A guy that can't keep a virus out of windows is preaching to people like you and people in the medical establishment who've actually spent years and years and years actually getting degrees and actually getting a formal education about viruses and pandemics and- We don't take we our medical degree, uh, our medical uh, theories or, or even any of our medical statements from, no. or people like uh, no. for that matter. There's lots no, but, of people who claim to but, have authority to say these things, but we don't. No, but Bill Gates, Bill Gates is the is pioneer of it. As it. He's, the, he's the showman. He goes around on BBC and around the world talking about this pandemic and talking about this virus, how we need a vaccine. And he is, he is part of, this is part of the whole agenda, which he right now is that we are seeing large proportion of the world right now in a huge, massive depression. There is, this is the biggest depression or economic collapse in history. In history, we've had uh, a stock market collapse, which is unprecedented. We have a we have a death we have a death per person ratio per population ratio, which is less than 0.01 percent. I think you're justified in actually saying that there is no reason. And if the virus exists, let's say it exists for one second, it's all agreed. It's all agreed to to shut down the world and to stop people living their lives for a, a virus which, again, statistically has a 0.001% chance of actually new. I find that very ludicrous and I find that very damaging, especially when people, especially in the third world, because you said, Amina, there's no conspiracy theorists in Africa and there's no conspiracy theorists in India. There's no conspiracy in third world countries because they're too busy trying to feed themselves to even worry about this. They're too busy trying to make ends meet for their family. And if the governments of this world were so concerned about our health and the people of Somalia or the people of Africa, and they were so concerned, why are they spending billions and billions of pounds vaccinating these people? They're spending billions and billions of pounds arming the teeth of these countries with military, but they are not cleaning the water. I've got a friend, I've got a friend whose dad has traveled to Uganda He's doing more, the black population in Uganda, and he's a, he's a black man himself, he's gone back to his roots. He's providing clean water, he's providing uh, clean sanitation for these people to thrive, and so they can live a, live a very a long, long and prosperous life, and hopefully they can live to, to old age. But the governments of this world, they, they, they pretend to protect us, they pretend to want to help us, they pretend that 
they, they, they care about us. But for the last 15 years, there's been a war on terror. They've gone around okay. the Middle East. James, no, your, no, your argument is going to all no, kinds one, of... No, but one thing You're I, talking one, about uh, several different bits here. No, but I am. It, 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 all, it all connects the dots. It all connects the dots because... Again, it connects the dots to, to fit the, the, what you believe in. It doesn't necessarily... No, no, it's not. It's not I believe in. Because it's, it's, it's you're talking I, about the economic and political impact of the virus versus no, does the virus exist. So that's two different conversations altogether. I, I, I just said, if it does exist, why has the governments of this world not actually looked to clean the... Uh, to, to provide fresh, uh, clean sanitation and fresh water to these people rather than shutting the whole world down, pretending that this virus exists and pretending it's as dangerous as everyone's making out it is. And people are all over the world, but all, I, I just don't get it. And I, I, Clean I water is a necessity. And there's a lot of unequal, inequalities in this world that is highly unjust. And I agree with you, um, James, in that. I've, we, we've been saying, I think a lot of people have been fighting the good fight for years, saying that we've taken a lot of resources from Africa, for example, but never have returned anything back to Africans. Over the years and throughout history, you're right, there's been a lot of imbalances, wars on terror, art cover-ups for basically looting and the resources of a country. You know, there's, there's lots of, you know, the top t uh, richest people in the world, the top 1% have the total GDP or the wealth of probably half the continent of Africa. Yes, I agree with you, but that's got nothing... Why do we believe them? Why do we believe them? If that is why do we why do you, why do you believe them on but don't believe them on anything else? Why do you, no, but that's the thing. You, well, like I said, we're intelligent human beings. You don't, you shouldn't at least just consume information. So the government will come out and tell us this virus exists. The government is telling us that it's killing a lot of people. The government is telling us this is what it is and this is what it is. But they've actually managed to back it up with the pictures of the virus, with how it works. With the pathology, well, and you're talking about some of the collection of symptoms like cough, fever, and respiratory problems. We know as medical professionals what the physiology, if we walk it back, we don't tell the entire public because not everybody is ready to consume that information or is even able to process it. There are physiological processes that lead to respiratory failure, that lead to fe uh, fever, and that essentially lead to death. So that's a totally different thing altogether. But for you okay, to- Okay, so how many, how many other diseases- Water and governments- Sorry, James, I'm just going to have to interrupt. We've got enough, quite a few questions. So the first question is from Samira. Um, it's from Farah Ahmed. And she said, what about dexamethasone? Is it not used as much? Okay, so dexamethasone is something that uh, our current health secretary is trying to make us believe is a brand new invention and a brand new drug that's being used to treat coronavirus. So that's come out relatively recently on the news. So dexamethasone is a very powerful steroid, and Amina will be able to tell you this as she worked in anesthetics as well before, even more detail. It's a powerful steroid that is used as an anti-inflammatory. And the, essential, the point of the matter is a lot of these conditions, but particularly coronavirus, the way it affects our body once the virus infects the whole cells and does what it needs to do, the way it actually causes a problem to us is it makes our immune system overreact. In other words, it goes into mass hysteria, it releases all kinds of inflammatory cytokines and hormones because the body is trying to attack the virus. But in the process of trying to attack the virus, the immune system goes in such overboard and overdrive that it starts attacking its own cells, which is why you start having inflammation of the lungs. You get water logging in the lungs, which is all the inflammatory fluids. You get difficulty breathing as a result of that. You get fever, you get joint aches, you get shutdown of the renal props, you know, in, in different severities. And dexamethasone essentially is used to reduce the severity of your own body's inflammatory response because it's your own body's inflammatory response to the virus that's causing these symptoms and these problems. So that's the essence of dexamethasone. And Matt, Matt Hancock, our general health secretary at the moment is making it sound like it's a new invention. And it's something that's been used for in ITU patients since the beginning of time because there are some conditions such as coronavirus and many other conditions where we don't actually have a cure some will never ever have a cure developed. We don't know. Yet prison. The case. So has, it, has, has, has it been used now during COVID-19? Yes, a lot of people have started using it. So people have tried so many things like anti-malarials to see if it'll work. Again, it takes years of research to get to the bottom and understand this virus better. better. And unfortunately, a lot of more people have to be sick and, 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 and have the virus for, for us to be able to understand how it affects the body, which is essentially the nature of disease and medicine as we know it at the moment. But uh, a lot of medicines have been trialed. So Maria, can I ask you, can I ask you a question? Wait, I'm, I'm severe I'm pneumonia I'm and so many other things as well. What questions for everyone? 
Thank you, Samira. Um, yeah. I think this question is for Abdi and James. It's from Samson Muhammad Ali. Can someone answer this? Why was it okay to be in the ambience of recycled air in supermarkets with large number of people, but yet the beaches were no-go areas? Very good. It's a very good question. And, and again, the, hyper, the hypocrisy of all of it. You, 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 they, they tell you one thing and then they're, they're letting people do another. Um, I, I, as far as, as far as I'm aware, I have, I have no issue of people going to supermarkets and I have no issue of people going to the beaches because I don't fear a virus just as much as I don't fear death and I don't fear ill health. So in terms of letting people do this and letting people do that, again, the government have continually, uh, unprecedented, constantly um, changed the goalposts whenever it suits them. And, and I think people are just generally fed up because the information that's been fed to them hasn't been clear, hasn't been concise, hasn't, hasn't actually filled the population with a, a lot of confidence. And do you know what? People just genuinely want to get outside. People just genuinely want to be out, outdoors in the sun. Because again, the sun has amazing healing properties and we do need it. But again, again, I, I have no issue with both. And again, the government have been so vague on, on anything. I'm, I'm surprised anyone knows what the actual current uh, the, the, what was it, the, the current uh, rules and regulations are to going out or meeting people. So yeah, that's the answer to that question. All right, thank you, James. Okay. We've got Samir, another- let me, Sorry. Let me ask something, Samir. Samir, this new, this new medication they're talking about, is it strange? It's not they, a new medication. Yeah, I know. So, 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 how come it's all of a sudden they never knew it works at the beginning before that? Before okay, the, first of all, I must say that I don't involve myself too much in politics, but there's a lot of things that this government said that sometimes it doesn't add up, and a lot of it could be related to saving face, and a lot of it could be related to being seen to be, to be doing something. I don't think they know as much as they claim they do about what's going on. And to be honest with you, part of it is the fact that it's a new virus to a lot of us. Nobody and can claim to know exactly what the tra trajectory of it is. So I think the, the information is changing all the time as new information comes to light. But I do agree with James in the sense that they've not really been clear and that's something they've been heavily criticized on. So I'm not gonna take away from that. But the coronavirus is real, nevertheless, whether Boris Johnson says this or that. And with regards to the ambient air in the supermarket, to be honest with you, you are at risk in your own home because a family member could bring it in from work. A family member could be bringing, bringing it in you know, from wherever they've come from. But you you have to shop for food, so I think it's a basis of necessity. I suspect. Uh, this this is a little bit off topic, but do you guys believe he actually got the caught caught the virus, Boris, or was he just whipping? Well, if he's theory? pretending, I'd like to know why, because I didn't see the aim, I didn't see the goal of it, I didn't see the point of him pretending. And okay. let, let me ask the other the, the the another question. It's from again Samson Muhammad Ali. Um, she says, fact is 600K die every year in the UK for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. And until end of the year, we won't really know whether we have, ex 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 if we have excess deaths or not. Mm -hmm. Is this true or not? Or can you already, um, as health, you know, frontline staff kind of see that it's going to be above the average uh, death toll that we have every year? Well, London annually, you London annually, been a um it's, it's reduced that the death reduced london annually by 2.5 percent we, so, we, we didn't get to the end of the year yet james though i don't know how you can make that no, but I, I'm just, up, up until now they're actually bringing out statistics saying there's not a difference between the annual deaths compared to any other year we're talking of slight increases in deaths again we're looking at respiratory diseases and we're looking at a heart disease they're decreasing but COVID-19 is actually increasing. So what are doctors actually prescribing? We're, we're, they're prescribing a whole host of symptoms because they're not actually looking at it from a viral point of view because they can't but see they the are, virus. But they are, James, but they are. The I don't think you've ever spent any time speaking to an ITU consultant. I don't think you've spent the time to actually understand how this virus, from the minute it affects your body, results in the symptoms. It's not just a collection of symptoms. It is to people who are not in the medical field, because that's all you can see. If you're only believing in what you can see, then of course this argument is a bit pointless, because a lot of things happen in the background well before that, before you even develop the symptoms. By the time you develop the symptoms, the virus has already done what it needed to do in terms of its cellular processes. So yes, there's a lot that happens before then, and we can walk you through you want in terms of the physiology of it but i'm not sure this is the place for it can i just say something guys and say amina 
And so the thing is, with regards to dexamethasone, dexamethasone is not a new drug. I've been using dexamethasone for like in anesthetics, we use it. It's a, so it's a very strong steroid, mashallah, but it also has very good anti-emetic qualities. And in anesthesia, we use it as an anti-sickness to stop people from getting sick after anesthetics. That's one thing. Number two, using steroids for respiratory diseases is nothing new. We've been using steroids, hydrocortisone, for asthmatics like since the dawn of time, right, Samira? And that's one thing. And there's another thing as well. Yes, I totally agree with you guys. There's, I don't think this government truly knows what they're talking about. I don't think they've prepared as well. And there's one thing that I forgot to mention, that the NHS actually started preparing way before Boris Johnson and his government said, you know what, stay. I think we were ahead of them by a week, but even by that week, it was still a bit too late to procure everything that we wanted. And we focused on training as many people to work in a new way because with the other thing with coronavirus is that it has changed the way we work in hospitals it has changed the way we anesthetize people it has to change the flow of like for example i work in the operating theaters the flow of work within the operating theaters so that's one thing uh sam, sam regarding your question about people going to the shops versus going to the beach so a lot of the shops that i've seen should have a maximum number of people so holland and barrett's for example you can have up to four people at any one time um brett the coffee shop allows six customers uh, at any one time the thing is what what and, and one thing that we still cannot do is because of the society that we live we cannot control people so yeah this is why i said this virus has just highlighted the nice people amongst us and the selfish people amongst us as well so the thing is there was no thing that says stay at home was pretty much clear stay at home and i think the stay alert message has been the most confusing message i've ever come across with i agree but exactly so what does stay alert really mean and the thing is of course we're human people human, human, human people we see the sun you want to put on your lovely clothes have your hair out and go to the beach and have a good time and get that tan I don't take from that, but it was all in the middle of a pandemic, the same as we having protests in the middle of a pandemic. It's, you know, we still cannot stop natural human behavior, which is why we are saying, look, here's the, here's, here's the information. Just like the conspirators are putting their information across, we, the healthcare workers, are giving you the information and saying, this is what we are dealing with, this is what we are seeing with. Yes, you cannot see the virus. We cannot see the virus. You can see the pictures that Samira's talked about. I haven't seen it, but I've seen the effects, I've seen the physical effects that it does to ventilated patients in ICU. I've seen a person gasping for breath. Okay, just before we're about to put the breathing tube down them. So this is everything we are saying. We're just saying to you, this is what's happening. Just please work with us. Now, if I, I'm going to use New Zealand as a country. New Zealand, the government involved the people, was very clear in its message, involved the population, um, involved the population from the very get-go. The thing is with this whole virus, the only way that we can it was through community engagement if the community did this thing and stopped the virus at community level the hospitals would be able to cope but the thing is just see it as a very thing that the coronavirus is coming through the community through through the pop general population through the clinics and even when you go through the hospital it's like you come through a and e you might get admitted to a coronavirus ward so this is not an intensive care ward this is just a ward and then if you don't if you if you become really sick then that's when you come on to like visit me in an intensive care unit. So there were stages to this virus. And the last point I wanted to take on, do you know what guys, I would not wish what I've seen, what coronavirus does to the human body on anyone. So I personally don't think that Boris Johnson was faking his um, coronavirus um, admission. I remember seeing one of the interviews that he did just before his uh, hospital admission. I remember thinking he does not look good. So I don't think that it was false. So that's my- I'm gonna, I'm gonna let me ask you a question. We've got a question yeah. from um, Moas de Hassanito. I hope I've uh, said I'm gonna, that. Just, just, um, just, just, does COVID-19 have any relation to Spanish flu? And why is it taking so much time to get a vaccine? Because it's a new thing. It's a new thing. You, the thing is, what we listen. We don't want to rush any vaccine. You don't want to. With, with a situation like this, you do not want to rush any vaccine. We're still learning. We are still learning. So the thing is, is like what this government is saying. Oh, Dex. Dex is not a new thing. I have been using dexamethasone since two thousand and four. Okay, it is not a new thing. Okay, team so and I'm gonna, has I'm been using it. Well, <laughs> quickly, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but one thing, Samira, I mean, and Ikran, he, the one thing you lot don't know, you lot don't know yet, is James's wife. She's a nurse. Yes. So, you, so, so, so it's 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 a little bit. Uh, That's even more interesting. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yes, hundred percent. Oh wow. I just okay. To let you guys know. So. 
And I just thought I'd mention it. Thanks, well. Abdi. Thanks, Abdi. That's very nice of you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for I think, I think James, James holds very intelligent arguments on his own, whether his wife exactly. is a doctor or a nurse or not. So let's not I take mean, that away from James. Uh, they're, 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 James, actually, James we've, got no, we're not we've got a question for you from um, Mona Abdurrahman Abdur Hussain to James. Do you think that the number of deaths are decreasing in cardio and other diseases because there are people with pre-existing conditions being severely affected by coronavirus? Therefore, the numbers are now merged. Those deaths are admissions haven't, haven't they, what? dropped. They have been masked under the COVID-affected people. So basically, did you get that question? Yeah, so just again, uh, it's breaking up a little bit. I would say this. I, it, COVID-19 to the medical establishment is like the same as being shot in their heads and you're 20 seconds from dying and then getting kicked in the stomach. Then what the, what the medical profession will do is say, well, the, it was the kick in the stomach that killed him. It wasn't, it wasn't, the, it wasn't lit, it was the kick in the stomach. So I do believe that a large proportion of these people who have died have been severely sick. They've had severe uh, underlying health conditions like cancers, dementia, Alzheimer's, But why do they all diseases. have the same collection of symptoms that just before they died? They have a lot oh, of... Well, they, but, but again, it's a again, commonality. Me, me, but, but me and you, again, I'm not going to talk about something I don't know. We and you have never met those 40,000 people that have died. We don't know about those collective symptoms. All we do know is, is that 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 is to say that again we we are just we, we're talking about we don't know nothing about no, but we're getting data from hundreds and hundreds of hospitals and it's the same yeah data that we're getting from hospital not not politicians this is data we're getting from itu consultants and doctors in hospitals yeah. who have actually dealt and treated these COVID-19 patients who have sadly died. And the collection of symptoms, whether they had pre-existing dementia, whether they had stroke, whether they had all of that. The, the, that's the, not the problem. But, that's, had, but your problem is- It's the same as the collection of symptoms that people who died in Spain and Italy had just before their death. So yes, I believe that there's all these underlying conditions who would have had, had a factor in COVID, you know, in the ultimate death, but COVID-19 also had a factor. The question then begs is, how much of a factor was the actual virus rather than pre-existing condition? And that's a very valid question. You can, you can, you can never, you can, you can never, you can never ascertain that. You can never ascertain that. And so to, to put on a death certificate, COVID-19 was the, was the, was the, was the primary cause of that death is you can't do that. It's impossible to do that. It's a collection of everything then. It's like, it's like me going out and me going out and eating a burger and then having a can of Coke and saying it's the can of Coke that made me sick. But no, no, that's not how it works, James. So for example, you're an 85-year-old lady. Let's just walk you through one case, right? You're an 85-year-old man who lives in a care home, who's known to have dementia, who's had two yeah. heart attacks in the past and has had um, successfully stents put in. So you're, you've, you've got chronic kidney failure, failure, which is being managed. You've got diabetes, which is being managed. So for the past 20 years, you've been teetering along. So you're alive, you're not healthy, but you're alive and you're teetering along and you haven't massively deteriorated. And then a virus comes along, which you're saying may or may not. Hasn't been proven. Which hasn't been proven. Yeah, but let's let's pretend it exists for argument's sake. Okay. 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 okay lovely. Let's, this virus comes along. You've been you've been this 85 year old man who's been teetering along with all your diabetes, all your chronic kidney problems, all your stro previous strokes and heart attacks. You've been managing okay. You haven't. Your baseline hasn't changed. Your mobility hasn't changed. Your energy levels hasn't changed. Your diet hasn't changed. Your weight hasn't changed. And then suddenly you get fever, worsening shortness of breath, you're coughing up phlegm, um, and then you're deteriorating. They take you to hospital, they do a swab, they find you've got this virus, right? You end up after a few days in ITU, and you may sadly end up dying. So yes, you did have the background of diabetes, dementia, heart attacks, strokes, and you've had these conditions for maybe the best part of the last 30, 40 years. But it was finally this collection of symptoms and the, the virus that tipped you over the edge. So if you are asking me to do a death certificate, and I've done multiple of those, I would put primary cause of death, COVID-19, and then I would put secondary causes, dementia, heart attack, because I know, I'm not saying that the coronavirus alone killed you. Coronavirus was the, the straw on the camel's back, as we'd call it. But yes, all these pre-existing conditions made your, your likelihood of death higher. So I would put all of that in the death certificate, with the main primary cause of death in that case being coronavirus. Does that make sense? Yeah, but you, you, answer, you answer the question for me because that what you just said there just actually proves the theory is that people people are getting 
symptoms of a healing crisis in the body at a certain time in their life. And do you know what? How these people have been propped up on the amount of drugs they're taking, the amount of operations they're, they've had, and they're still alive, is testament to the, how strong and how, how amazing the human body is. And, and, and that's what it comes down to. The fact that we can, me and you cannot prove, sit here right now and say these people have had symptoms of coronavirus or they've had the coronavirus, which then kicked them over the edge, is we can't say that. So, but we can say, and we but can But why prove, can't we say that? I just explained to you why we, we can't. Can. We can't, because me and you have not met those 40,000 people. And for all we know, no, that's No, true, but then, no, no, true. There's a lot of things that we believe as facts, even though we're not physically there, um, because based on based on the on, on the knowledge and the and the and the documents and the information that's coming out, so you don't have to be James physically present in every lab when they're cooking up uh, a, you know a, a new uh, drug, for example. You don't have to be present when they when they're proving certain theories, whether it's in medicine or anything else, for you to believe it. We read books and we 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 learn about these things, even though we're not directly present. So that argument doesn't exist. But coming back to the fact that we cannot definitely say that they haven't died of coronavirus because we weren't there. Even if you were there, our eyes don't tell us anything. Even if you were physically there, your eyes would not tell you anything. Right. I'll tell you why I believe it. It's, I don't believe politicians, but I believe when thousands and thousands of doctors across several countries, including South Korea, including Singapore, including India, including Turkey, including Spain, including Italy, including Britain, including the USA, have generated the same type of data to say that all of, interestingly enough, all these patients that ended up dying had these same collection of symptoms, regardless of whether oh. you're an 85 year old white man or a 25 year old black girl or have had these pre-existing conditions, Ultimately, just before their deaths, when you analyze all the deaths that they call coronavirus, they've all had this sudden onset of these collection of symptoms. We've managed to prove by swab tests that they had coronavirus coincidentally, but it was these collection of symptoms that eventually caused their death. And it's the same across the board. At what, point, at what point do you start to believe that these collection of symptoms actually follow a pattern that may be related to this, this new virus that they found? Okay, All what, right, so what about... So, what? So James and Samira, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you guys. We've been talking for two hours now. And I think oh, sorry. if you guys had the chance... It's all your fault. It's all your we, <laughs> we can continue for more than 24 hours. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do now, we're going to go in alphabetical order. If you guys can just give your closing argument and you know your final points... Um, please try to stick to five minutes if you can. Uh, we'll start with you, Abdi. And if everyone else can just put themselves on mute so we can hear everyone speak clearly. Thank you. Now, to finish it, to finish it on, on a good note, uh, in 2004, in 2004 I, I had a bad car accident. So if we weren't for the NHS uh, that, that stitched me up and got me back to uh, walking distance, I mean, so I, I'm really grateful and obviously, uh, Ikram, Amina, and, and Samira, James, our sister, my sisters are the most hardworking nurses in, in the industry. Uh, how, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you gathered. And, and one thing, you wish you, wish you start, instead of clapping every Thursday, they need a, they need a 100% get, get a pay rise because they work so hard. And obviously, uh, which, is, which is very uh, admirable of, 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 of them. But yeah, that's it. Thanks, girls. And it was, it was nice. Adela, before before you finish off, I just want to ask you, has your opinion after this debate changed in any way? Not one bit, no. <laughs> okay. But it's, been, but it's been nice. Okay, thank you, Abdi. On to Amina Ibrahim. Uh, so first things first, what's it called? Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, taking part in the debate. What's it called? Sorry for shouting at you, Abdi, but my frustrations come to, that to me, this coronavirus is a very, very personal thing because I told you like just how it just changed my life and um, the life of other and many other healthcare professionals, you know, like we've it has removed us from our families. We all had to live like say in hotels all by ourselves. So with everything that we're seeing at work, you know, daily, hourly, and the shift pattern that we were doing, and then to come home to nobody and, you know, just, you know, like have, you know, meant to be, be mentally strong to deal with it and then go back again for more the next day. So I want to thank, like, say, my colleagues, um, my colleagues and, like, say, my family and people, like, who've helped me through it. Alhamdulillah. So first things first, so Mali, coronavirus is real, okay? It's real, it's real, it's real. Don't let no Adana tell you it isn't. Work home. Number two, number two, number two, this virus 
if we're going to beat it as a human race, it needs all of us to come together and look out for one another. So just because you are fit and healthy and fit as a fiddle doesn't mean that you can flaunt the rules because it might be that was so called, um, you know, and your a year you wouldn't be able to do. So some of the stuff that we've seen in Italy with uh, in, and in Spain, where a lot of elderly were dying, is because they lived in intergenerational households, and it was the young people who were going out and about bringing it to their nanas, and that's how the nanas that have died. Okay, but uh, number three, what's so called, I am overall from a medical point of view, how we're coming together, despite the lack of government uh, uh, support sometimes, despite the fact that many people are not listening to us, despite the fact that people are sometimes are going to the beach. So we're talking, we talk, we spoke a little bit about the hypocrisy. The hypocrisy was the people who voted for a government that hates the NHS is the, and then clapped for me every Thursday without fail. But then while they're clapping for me, y'all not social distancing, you know what, stop your claps. So the thing is, what I'm saying to you guys is that despite need, all of that, we have managed you, to- You guys need a pay rise instead of clapping. I want a pay rise and I want less people in the world like you, Abdi, because your idiocy is also not helping. Okay, so what's so called? And I would argue that as well as the virus, I would also, my, my argument still when it comes to Somali community, the lack of appropriate information and the lack of correct information getting to our people has actually killed people and I know this sounds such a harsh thing to say but that's because I've seen it with my own two eyes in the beginning had a lot of Somali patients in the uh, ICU towards the end I had no Somali patients furthermore I was just you know like one hospital when I spoke to my colleagues across five other centers in London you know what they didn't have it too so you know what information is a big thing here so that's my thing so yes please it's real it's ilalia du'esta and illahin badio. that's my closing statement all right, I mean. thank you, Amina. Next is James. If you're not speaking, can you please make sure you put yourself on mute so we can hear everyone else? So, Abdi, please make sure you put your mic, uh, mic on mute, yeah? Okay. Um, I'd like to thank all the Somali people for listening today. I'd like to thank Abdi for putting me on here. I'd like to thank Samira and Amina. I would not like to be married to you two because I think I'll be dead by the end of the week because you guys are very fierce, you're very aggressive. I thought Indian women were scary. You guys are even more scary than my wife. So, you know, I respect you. I, I love you to bits. I say, well, you are two tough nuts and I don't want to mess with you two ever again. Okay. But I would like to say to all the viewers on here tonight, the body is a self healing organism. There is no drug. There is no chemical, which is going to heal the body. The body will heal itself, provide, given the right environment. Nature doesn't make mistakes. We make mistakes. Try and eat as much raw food as possible. Try and get as much exercise. Try and get as much sunlight. When you have a fever, um, is a sign or a symptom of a time to fast. So try and get into fasting. Try and research natural hygiene. Try and focus on taking responsibility for your health. If a virus does exist, which I know in the medical literature, they've never proven that one does, but me and Samira are going to talk afterwards so she can provide me that information. Take responsibility for your health. Stop going to these fast food restaurants. Stop, uh, stop eating processed food. Stop drink, drinking sodas. Stop uh, d delving into things which is not good for the human body. Drink as much water as possible, which is the number one biggest cause of most ill health. Try and try your best to look after yourself because if a virus is if a virus is real and it's going to get you, make sure you give yourself the right environment to deal with the problem in the first place. Because you know what. I'm not ignorant enough to know that I might be wrong. And if I am wrong, I'm wrong. But if Samir is wrong, millions of people are wrong. All so right. that is the big, that's the scary part. But I'm thank you very much for your time. Love you all. James, I just want to ask you a quick question because I'm being asked to ask this question to you and Abdi just really quick. And I just want a really simple answer. So no 10 minute answer, just a quick answer. So the question is to Abdi and James, if you put your beliefs aside for a minute about where the virus came from and if it's real and you assume the virus is real, which would have a better outcome for our vulnerable community members, educating them on how to protect themselves or fueling conversations about conspiracies, which fur furthers people away from taking safe measures and puts them at risk, which do you think would save more lives? Staying away from the hospitals. All right, thank you, James. So next we have Ikram. I'm here. I'm here, Amina. I think you put your your thing was on mute, but 
Um, this has been definitely an interesting debate. Obviously, it's been it's open up a lot of topics that you know that actually needs research, needs time for you to think about it, needs everything. But one thing that I will definitely be closing off with is. Don't be selfish, guys. You might not believe in coronavirus or you might not think, you might have a friend that might not believe in it, but there's people that do believe in it. There's elderly people in your houses. There's kids. Please do be safe. Play, stay safe. Um, even if it takes you to just talk about it to your community, get the word out there. Um, we need to stop this whole thing where it comes with giving out the wrong information and people need to know what are right and what is wrong. So inshallah, guys, that's my closing statement. <laughs> Thank you, Kram. Last but not least, Dr. Samira Hassan. I'm going to start off by saying this has got to be one of the most interesting debates I've taken part of. So I, I've enjoyed myself, guys. And thank you so much for engaging. Honestly, I am going to start off by saying the the NHS is not a perfect organization by any means. And we have our flaws, but it's, it's great for many things. Medicine as a practice and as a field in itself is not without its problems and it does have a lot of problems. Sometimes it generates more problems than it cures, but of course there's a role for it as well to help people heal. And another thing I would say is I'm a huge advocate of encouraging healthy lifestyle and making sure that you, your, your patients, or at least I try to get my, my patients and empower them to take control of their health because no doctor can control your health for you. No doctor can make you healthy. You have to take the necessary steps, some of which Jay, Jay, James has outlined, some of them that you have to do to make sure that your body is at its optimum health, at its peak level, so that any virus, bacteria, anything else, you're even more likely to survive a road traffic accident if you're a stronger, fitter person, depending on the force you've been hit with. So it, it helps you with everything in life, even with mental health. So I'd definitely say that. And one thing I'd also say is to everybody, not just, not just the, you know, everybody in the human population, but even to our medical healthcare professionals, don't be passive consumers of information. Don't take anything that somebody says to you, particularly something as important as something like coronavirus or a pandemic as fact. I think every field in the world, whether you look at economics or medicine or architecture or art, everything needs to be backed up by facts, debates, and knowledge. So I, I, it's something I tell my Somali women all the time. Don't just say, don't just take what the doc, medical doctor says to you as Quran, as Bible. Don't just believe everything they say. Question them. Try and understand them. Ask them to send you the facts and figures. Ask them to send you the research. And then hopefully make up your own mind. Because I am a strong believer in shared decision making. I don't believe in telling people what to do, telling them what to take. I'll give them my arguments for it. And then you decide based on the information whether it's good for you or not. So that's definitely something I would say. But as humans, we're fickle, we're fickle in our characters. We want to be healthy, but we do so many things in which, which is not healthy. But nevertheless, that doesn't take away from the fact that something as real as coronavirus, which has been proven, like I said, in many ways, it's been seen on an electron micrograph, it's been isolated in these PCR tests, its actual effects have also been isolated in the antibody tests, and it's been tested and isolated in labs all over the world, outside the host cell. All of that has been done. And Tons and thousands and thousands of people who have died of coronavirus, or at least we claim to have died of coronavirus, have died with the same collection of symptoms, whether you, regardless of your sex, regardless of your age, regardless of your socioeconomic background, regardless of your previous pre-existing conditions, you had the same collection of physiological processes towards the end that has caused your death. And that is what we call COVID-19, the collection. A disease is defined as a collection of symptoms. That's what it is. But it's the process before that that we're neglecting to cover. So COVID-19 is the disease, and that is the common collection of symptoms that have killed all, this, all these people. And I will believe a worldwide chorus of healthcare professionals who have spent their life and dedicated their life to caring people while they're putting themselves at risk and danger rather than politicians. So if hundreds and hundreds and thousands of doctors from across the world are spewing out the same information, there has to come a point where you start to question your own theories, unless you just want to be one of those people who wants to only look for information to fit what you believe. That shouldn't be the case. We're not Fox News and CNN. You need to look for information and it may change your views. You shouldn't just look at facts that will fit your theories because that's not the way the world will progress. And I will end with, please be careful. This state alert business does not work. Be careful and make sure you take all the necessary precautions because if you're not worried about yourself, be worried about people around you, your colleagues, your families, your friends, your workplaces. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Samira.
this has definitely been one of the most interesting topics that I've ever listened to. Thank you all. Thank you, Abdi, James, Ikram, um, Salma that had to leave us before because she had a night shift. Amina, Dr. Samira for taking part. Um, thank you. When am I back on? When am I back on? I, I, I love this. This is brilliant. This is what a fantastic Saturday night. This is like a party for me. I love this. You know, I got, I'm, 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 James, it's been we'll the best, to, we'll best have, in years. We'll have to have you and Samira back on, you know. Oh, no. And, <laughs> Around two. Well, um, I, well, you know what, um, Ikram, you are the most loveliest lady in the world. Samira, oh my god. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment, James. I'll take that as a compliment. You know what? I tell you what. I, I, you know what? And I would say this to the Somali community as well. Respect all women because women are the most important things on this planet. And if you don't here, respect here. your, if you don't respect your, you are worthless. You, you are the king, but remember, they are the queen. Okay, so look after them. On that note, my wife is going to have a go at me. I've got to go and see her. She's going to beat me up. Thank you very much for your time, guys. Thank I look you, forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye.